Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Wednesday, November 14th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Marcy Wheeler, journalist, proprietor of EmptyWheel.net. On Matt Whitaker and Donald Trump's what could be soon to be failed attempt to shield his kids from indictment also on the program today white house eh, imploding's a strong word as melania champions the iran deal well maybe not quite finally she did one not exactly but borderline props and speaking of finally finally someone lends a helping hand to amazon New York to give it $1.7 billion worth of tax breaks and incentives. And as recounts continue in Florida, Republicans keep losing House seats across the country. Final Democratic tally could net 40 House seats and over 300 statewide flips. Meanwhile, Democrats pretty blue, looking pretty blue. Yes, Democrats unified in fighting the Republicans' attempt at quashing the War Powers Act's use to curb the Yemen fight. Meanwhile, uh, corporate Dems fall flat on their latest AOC attack, and top census scientists blows the alibi on the anti-immigrant census questions. Meanwhile, top climate change uh, scientists had a slight computation error in uh, the acceleration of the warming of the seas, but we're not out of the woods yet. No. As 48 dead in California, wildfires continue to rage. And lastly... Hate crimes rose big time last year. Bigly. All that and more on today's Majority Report. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today we have a uh, an interview that I uh, pre-taped with Marcy Wheeler uh, about 36 hours ago. And there is one update. And it's interesting. I want to go back and, and, and find out her, her take on this. And um, maybe I'll give you an update uh, after the the interview. But during the course of the interview, one of the things that comes up is a meeting by some key players in the Trump administration, players whom I had speculated, uh, many others had speculated. Usually when I speculate, I'm It's based upon readings of other people's speculation. I should tell you that. Um, And there was concern about the people who were in succession to Jeff Sessions, including the uh, Solicitor General, other other individuals in the Trump administration. And according uh, to to Marcy Wheeler, it turns out uh, these people are not quite as horrid as we may have anticipated, but that is still unclear. Part of that was um, based upon a presumption that she had that the Office of Legal Counsel 
in the Department of of Justice, the OLC being essentially the administration's legal ad advice as to what is legal within the context of uh, the executive branch and um, uh, how government works. Not so much, you know, Donald Trump's lawyer, but rather uh, the president has the powers to torture if, you know, John Wu is working there. Uh, and um, so uh, the OLC has just come out with a memo saying that Whitaker's hiring, or I should say uh, hiring as acting attorney general is legal. There is a suit that has been filed in Maryland right now to fight that. But uh, nevertheless, I just want to give you that update. Um, the OLC's ruling is less relevant because there's already a suit in some respects, because it's going to be tried in court. Um, the OLC, had they come out and said it is not legal, that would have basically made it much harder to maintain, for the administration to maintain the um, the premise that his hiring was legal. But um, Marcy Wheeler will get into this uh, much more in, in just a moment. Um, want to remind you folks, oh, oh, this is actually good. Uh, I took this home and um, I've tried it out and it's already become a source of um, a bit of a fight between Saul and I. There is no need to suffer through another sleepless night. Now, as I've mentioned, I have sometimes I have problems sleeping. Um, and Calming Comfort, it's a blanket by Sharper Image, is the luxurious weighted blanket that helps you relax so you can fall asleep and stay asleep naturally. Have you ever had one of these? A weighted I blanket? I have, but it sounds very appealing. Well, you know, you, uh, the, the big thing that people in bedding now have are comforters and they generally tend to be pretty light right but you forget you get a nice heavy blanket on you it makes you uh go to sleep now this is what i like to do i like to keep the windows open and i like to let it be a little bit cold I and do then i like well. to put a blanket on yes well uh saul likes that too we now have a fight over the blanket it's designed with high-density comfort film. Do you muscle him out of it? I mean, that's a little bit of an unfair No, he fight. screams. Yes, I can ah, beat him he up. he screams yes. so he wins. Okay, good. good. To provide exactly the right amount of weight to help relax your body, it mimics the soothing feeling of being hugged and helps the production of serotonin and melatonin. That's the thing. Saul does not like it when I hug him. He's like, don't, you're crowding me, he says. <laughs> So you can sleep better, feel great, stress less. Plus, made with super soft, velveteen material, calming comfort is 100% machine washable, dryer safe. Um, so uh, basically what happened is I got the blanket. I've been using it the past couple of nights. We do a, I don't know, I don't need to get too specific about the arrangement that uh, Nikki and I have, but it's a 2255. And uh, people who are divorced may know what that is. And uh, so uh, Saul will climb into bed with me, you know, two or three times uh, over the five days I'm there. First uh, day he does, he comes in, he likes this blanket. Next night, can I use this blanket? Then the fights begin. Nevertheless, maybe the answer is you get two. But... Um, I'm not getting him his own blanket. He can. He's a kid. He can deal with it. Uh, the father-son rivalry. Exactly. In action. The Calm and Comfort weighted blanket comes with a 90-day anxiety-free, stress-free, best night's sleep of your life guarantee from Sharper Image right now. Just for listeners of the Majority Report, you can go to calmingcomfortblanket.com. That's calmingcomfortblanket.com. Use the promo code MAJORITY at checkout. Get 15% off the displayed price. Again, that's calmingcomfortblanket.com, promo code MAJORITY. And because you can't uh, put a price on a great night's sleep, go online now. Calmingcomfortblanket.com, promo code MAJORITY for your special discount today. Um, so yesterday uh, it was revealed, and 
Andrew Cuomo, Bill de Blasio, some union reps at a uh, press conference in New York City that New York, New York had won the lottery. They were splitting it. Half the lottery. Yeah, mega millions. They were splitting it with um, a place outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, the details of the plan are essentially that um, New York is providing at least, and I'm seeing higher numbers, because here's the thing. This is the plan, right? I mean, this is not the exactly the same thing as Foxconn, although the way these things go is generally in the same trend. You make the deal, then the jobs don't quite reach the amount that they're going to be, but the costs get ex exceeded. I mean, this let, just put it this way. The numbers they announced today, I guarantee you, will go in opposite directions. The cost to the, um, to the city and the state will go up, and the, the supposed benefits will go down. Because, and we know this, because every single type of incentive deal like this that takes place anywhere, that's the trend that it goes. But even if you are convinced that it's still worth it, I got a buddy of mine who is convinced that it's, he, he, it's a good deal. Uh, it's a good deal. We make deals. He's in tech. And oh. I, am, so he's a I, neutral have, observer. I have no doubt. I have no doubt that this will increase the size of the tech industry in New York. I'm sure it will. Cool. The point is at what <laughs> the point is at what cost? I mean, even if you think it's a, Super I'm awesome. speaking specifically, but, but, but the, the problem, um, with this is what it does to the broader community. And AOC does not represent, um, Long Island city as a, as a uh, listener, uh, uh, corrected me on, but the implications of it are going to spread out. I mean, this is the way it happens, right? Like as soon as Long Island city gets priced out, and, 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 and metropolitan New York has already driven out um, hundreds of thousands, if not close to a million middle class um, uh, folks, because it's just simply too expensive. And this is going to maintain that, that, that trajectory. Um, AOC came out and said, this is a billion dollar company. The idea that it will receive hundreds of millions of dollars in tax breaks at a time when our subway is crumbling, our communities need more investment, not less, is extremely concerning to residents here. Yeah, at the very least. But, but, let's be fair. Stuart Vani of uh, Fox Business visited Fox and Friends today to make the substantive case as to why New York City needs this. Now, remember, okay, maybe Amazon would go somewhere else if there was no incentives. And I say maybe because it's quite clear. Amazon needs New York far more than New York needs Amazon. There's a reason why they chose these two places. Because they want to be near the, the, the seats of power in this country. They don't want to be the primary, um, they don't want to go to a place where they dominate the uh, the scene like they do in Seattle because it causes too much scrutiny on them. I really thought Tulsa had a chance. Well, that's the thing. If you go to a city like that, you're expected to do something for the community, <laughs> honestly. And here, nobody's going to be saying, like, where's Amazon contributing? To They're going to throw a couple of bones. But this is a, this is a trillion-dollar company. Maybe a trillion is a little bit much. But it is, we're talking... Uh, this is 10, a company worth uh, 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 billions upon billions of dollars. The idea that they need a subsidy to come here is, um, uh, is, is a joke. But nevertheless, New York does not need Amazon. However, let's hear the argument from the other side. There could be a very substantive argument here as to why we should be investing in Amazon. This is putting aside all the other problems that we might have with Amazon. Any argument I can make about Amazon three days ago, I still make that the 
company itself is problematic in terms of its size. We had um, an interview. When was that, Brendan? That we had on uh, from uh, the the woman from Portland, Maine. Uh, and and what what was? Yeah, uh, Mitchell. And uh, about Amazon's attempt to become the market, not just dominate a market, but to become the market. But putting all that aside, let's hear the argument as to why it's a good thing here. The young lady does not understand growth. You've got to grow a business. She doesn't understand growing a business. You've got to put money in to get money out. And some of the money pause it for gonna... one second. Now, pause it for one second. Now, I don't know what business he's talking about. Amazon... That business is growing, but it's not the business of the state of, of New York to grow Amazon. All right. Amazon's going to grow anyways. Uh, that's a big part of the problem. Now, maybe he's talking about New York State as growing a business. But New York State is not a business. It's a state. And the mission of New York State is not to increase its GDP. The mission of New York State is to help the lives of its citizens. Yeah, you guys can agree to disagree on that one. We can agree to disagree, but let's hear Varney's. Come on, this is going to be. We want to be fair and balanced here. Let him have his say. This is Econ 101. Here we go. Understand growing a business, you got to put money in to get money out. And some of the money does go to infrastructure, right? Oh, absolutely, it does. Infrastructure. I think they're building a new high school. They're going to build, build a new school. A school. But the price per job is something like forty-eight thousand dollars per job that New York is giving up in tax. Breaks. Actually, it's sixty-one thousand dollars per job in New York City, which is a very stiff price. I think it's worth it. Because to bring in a company like that, with all that money and no jobs, to a company like what are you, you going to say right. no? Go someplace else. So if they're giving up sixty thousand per employee, what does the average employee make there? I don't know. I, right. I simply don't know what what kind of employees they're going to get. I don't know the. Answer uh, to that I do question. know this. So that's the argument. Uh, I minored don't know the details. Just know, like, what are you going to do? Say go somewhere else. I minored in economics at uh, Bates, and I hated the numbers, but I did end up acing my finals with a. The where are you going to do? Go somewhere else yeah. argument? You're going to let them go somewhere else? How much uh, is that going to cost? I don't know. Like you understand I economics, I economics very I well, young know. man. It's expensive, yes. But I also like how he basically is making all these Keynesian arguments all of a sudden. Well, Because I like it's like, well, wait a second. All of a sudden, we aren't worrying about spending and we're not being tightwads because you have to spend something to make something. I guess this only well, applies when you're giving corporate welfare. Here's the point. If New York State is capable of providing $50,000, $61,000 per person for a job. Why not go out and hire people to do exactly, exactly what will benefit New York State? Build Rather new doing, high schools, fix the subways. I don't know. Let's, let's just assume for a moment, like we don't even have ideas as to what that is. Surely there is a commission that could come up with a list of things that the state could do that would increase the um, the happiness and the productivity, if you want, or whatever it is, the value of being a citizen of New York State that would undoubtedly have benefits to other people, but it wouldn't even be a bank shot. How can we benefit people directly? And maybe that is we, you know, like a, a, a local state senator who says, let's get rid of all of New Yorkers student debt. I mean, we know the implications of that in terms of the economic value of that, right? More people buy. The, the number one reason given by the president of the Home Builders Association in the nation for why uh, there have been um, the, the, the number one inhibitor to building new homes is student debt, according to the president of the Home Builders Association of the United States. I mean, just There's as an indication. There's many numbers for this argument. What you should just say is, we should just get rid of student loans. What, are you going to say no to that? Well, I mean. It doesn't make any sense. The, there are so many other ways to directly benefit New Yorkers if you're going to expend this money. And since we now know that we can expend this money, let's expand it. And if Amazon says, well, then in that case, we're going to go to Boston Fine. Fine. 
the reason why they want to come to New York is because New York is New York. And uh, I think in Boston, I would suggest that they also don't offer them that kind of money. Yeah. But that's, I mean, and ultimately. And then Bezos will put on his secret bionic suit he's been working on and just start taking out cities. Right. I yeah. mean, this is where this is going. I mean, if you look at his steroid regimen, this is a very disturbing <laughs> time and trend. We've all seen what happens with Lex Luthor. I'm not an accelerationist, but. Uh, but I am. If. I mean, I feel like we have no choice. We're all riding the wave right now. And uh, if giving up basic public services to build a helipad for the richest man in the world brings on the rev, increases class consciousness, silver linings. Well, I, and just so that people know what you're talking about, apparently there's uh, they're going to build a helipad and he gets 100 essentially like passes of um, where he can do over 100 of where he can do his uh, helicopter flights in. I mean, uh, so Blasio is a tough negotiator. But He's I mean, look, listen, listen, it's easy to no. poo poo. It's easy to poo poo that. But think of how much work that means. You're going to be hiring one more guy who's going to be at the helipad uh, full time. Um, Velocity of money. And, and then and then there's all the arguments as to why. Um, why. Amazon is problematic, period. I what mean, are you so, going to do? Say so, no to them? So, you know, it is a problematic thing to do if you don't care about monopolies and the implications of Amazon, you know, nationally and um, as, as an entity. But then it's a problematic thing to do from the perspective of just being like a mayor or a governor of a city or a state. Just got to... Hopefully, oh, Bill de Blasio will be listening to this podcast and one of his commutes from the Upper East Side to go walk on a treadmill in Park Slope. There you go. Um, folks, speaking of health, nice segue, Michael. One of the most important things we do for our health every day is brushing our teeth. Yet most of us can't do it properly. I swear to God, this is completely impromptu. No, today, as we said, we had a Quip ad. Michael literally said, like, oh, Quip. I mean, this is not even a joke. <laughs> it's weird. I'm shocked at how good this toothbrush is. <laughs> it literally forces you to speak like ad copy in real life. Quip is a better electric toothbrush. It's created by dentists and designers. Quip was designed to make brushing your teeth more simple, affordable, and even enjoyable. With sensitive sonic vibrations, it's gentle on your sensitive gums. My dentist, I had a deep cleaning last Thursday. Where they shot me full up of uh, Novocaine. And the dentist was like, just take it, put it on the angle. I said, I got the quip. She's like, good. That's the best kind. That kind of the vibrating kind. Uh, the built-in two-minute uh, timer pulses every 30 seconds to remind you when to switch sides and guide you to a full and even clean. What we got to do is come up with a, maybe a quip where I am singing uh, the ABCs. Because that's what I do for oh, Saul. That's a good idea. Better yet, Quip doesn't require a clunky charger. Instead, it runs for three months on one charge, and it comes with a multi-use cover that mounts to your mirror for a less cluttered sink space. No wonder Quip is one of the first electric toothbrushes accepted by the American Dental Association. Folks, you know uh, why uh, I love my Quip. I'm, I'm like slowly everyone around me is going to have a Quip. Everyone. Everyone around me. I've already bought a quip for somebody. You did? Yeah. Really? Yes. Well, I'm also very supportive of people's uh, oral hygiene. Who might that be? Oh, my dad. Okay. I'll find that up, sure. That yep. sounds like a story. <laughs> Folks, <laughs> I know how you You use will these love quip as much, apparently, as we do in the office. It's getting weird. Uh, they are backed by over 20,000 dental professionals. Quip starts at just 25 bucks. And if you go to getquip.com slash majority right now, you get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip, G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash majority. You know what? I mean, I gave uh, a Quip to my sister for... I don't know if it was Hanukkah last year. It's not the most, you know, sort of like um, luxurious, w w like, uh, but it is a really practical thing that she is super, super psyched that I got her. 
super, super psyched. Uh, and you can buy, you know, like a, a year's worth of refills in advance. You get the first one free. Uh, check it out. Getquip.com slash majority. All right. Uh, quick break and right back with this pre-recorded interview, Marcy Wheeler. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program Marcy Wheeler. She is the proprietor of EmptyWheel.net. Uh, uh, Marcy, welcome back to the program. Always good to be on. So on October 30th, uh, you wrote a piece in the New Republic uh, entitled, If Trump Fires Mueller, um, anticipating that perhaps after the election, we may see some action on that front, and we did, uh, but it started with Jeff Sessions. Let's, um, let's, let's start with, with that, but, but what, is the, what is the top line that we should be aware of at this point following the election in regards to uh, Trump and Trump Inc., I guess, in terms of their legal jeopardy? We don't know. Uh, we don't know. And I don't think we'll know for about a week or so about what happens with Mueller. And it may be within that week that we actually learn a lot more about what kind of legal jeopardy Trump is in. So this is going to be a busy week. Uh, so, all right, well, but maybe or maybe, you know, Mueller will get fired and we'll all go to the beach or something. Right. OK, well, all right. let's start with this then. Um, l let's walk through the uh the the firing because i think the um the uh the piece that i think is most instructive of yours at least um for the moment the most comprehensive is the question did ebbett flood uh mean to create a legal morass or is he off his game uh so donald trump so well okay so emmett flood was uh by your reckoning one of the few competents that donald trump brought on board he was um he helped uh, Cheney uh, deal with uh, the special counsel in Congress back in the day. Uh, he's a longtime uh, Washington, I guess, um, uh, lawyer uh, defending uh, politicians in various things. I think he was involved in the, maybe even Clinton's uh, impeachment. Yep. Um, all right. So, OK, so let's start with this question of what is the relevance of whether Jeff Sessions was fired and or or resigned and when okay so um really quickly to go over what happened is um starting at 11 30 the day after the election trump gave a press conference lied about how well the republicans had done when that was going on trump had already had john kelly call sessions and say we want your resignation session said can i have until the end of the week kelly called back um, later and said, nope, we want it today. Um, and he replaced Sessions with his chief of staff, a guy by the name of Matt Whitaker. And Whitaker, um, on paper, is sort of qualified. He was U.S. attorney for one of the districts in Iowa under Bush. So, yeah, he's a lawyer, at least, which, you know, <laughs> you might not get that from Trump. Right. Um, but he's really a hack. I mean, he's he's kind of the quintessential Republican hack. He spent much of 2017 saying, here's how to get rid of the Mueller probe. He was interviewed that summer for a job as part of uh, Trump's White House counsel defense team. And then um, in the fall, he was... He didn't get the White House counsel job. He was made Jeff Sessions' chief of staff. Jeff Sessions' chief of staff was given a big promotion, creating an opportunity there. The White House forced Sessions to hire this guy, Whitaker. And so he has been a senior DOJ official for a year. And under some interpretations of the law, that means that if Sessions resigns, you can replace him with somebody of sufficient seniority 
um, in a temporary appointment. And that's what the government, that's what Trump claims happened. Um, now, it's, un, you know, it, it's clear that Sessions was forced to resign. He made that clear in the front, the first line of his letter. And the Democrats in the House in, are... In, let me just be clear on that. In, in the first line of his letter, he said, you've asked my resignation, here it is, right? It was something right, to that effect. Right, I'm paraphrasing, right. but uh, he made it clear that he didn't offer this except for upon the, at the very least, the insistence or the request and there may be no difference right when you're talking about the president uh that he resigned right, right. And, and also frankly um you know if if kelly says can we have your resignation he says friday you can have it and kelly says no we want it today that makes that seems to me it's a coerced resi- it's, a, it's an even more coerced resignation and the democrats in the house are making it very clear that they believe it was a firing if he was fired, if Sessions was fired, then Whitaker's appointment is not legal um, because you can only have him in place rather than somebody who's Senate confirmed if Sessions resigns. Basically, the idea is the president can't fire somebody to then put in place somebody who was not Senate confirmed. Um, in addition, um, there are a couple of other questions about whether he would be a legal not, uh, appointment as well, including from Neil Katchel, who is the guy who wrote the special counsel regulations, um, and George Conway, Kellyanne Conway's husband. Um, and they argue that, um, for one, because you have a Senate-confirmed person right there in the form of Rod Rosenstein, who is the person who would take over if the attorney general were gone or disabled, you got to go with him. You can't go with this hack from Iowa. Um, and you also, there are rules that say you can't do this in, in DOJ. Katchell has written another piece that says even if his appointment is legal, he can't supervise Mueller because then you have basically an inferior officer supervising an inferior officer. In other words, there's a bunch of reasons to think that uh, his appointment is not legal and that his um, supervision of Mueller is not legal and um you know, everyone's talking about, well, we don't know and we won't be able to decide whether that's true or not unless somebody gets um, standing and challenges his appointment in court. But that's actually not true. And um, this is one of the most interesting things from last week. CNN did this great, by thus far, like one of the only really good uh, reports on the firing. And it described how as soon as John Kelly called Sessions, he... And Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, who's the guy who we're seeing Mueller right now, um, his principal deputy, who is also involved in overseeing Mueller, and this is uh, really key, um, uh, the Solicitor General, Noel Francisco, who's the third-ranking DOJ official, um, assuming Sessions is still there, on that day he was the third-ranking, and then also... Stephen Engel, who is in charge of the Office of Legal Counsel, who, again, Senate confirmed, very senior DOJ official, all of them, with the exception of um, Rosenstein's deputy, all of them were senior to Whitaker. And they're sitting in the room with Jeff Sessions going, what do we do and how do we protect the Russian investigation? And according to CNN's report, somebody in that room that they don't name said, we don't even know if this is constitutional, just like the rest of us are, except the difference being that in that room, Stephen Engel is the guy who, for DOJ, for the entire executive branch, is the one who decides whether these things are legal. So I at least suspect that those people said, okay, Steve, give us an opinion. Give us a memo. And how soon can you have it done? Because if he comes back and says, no, it's not legal under, under the Vacancies Reform Act, you can't have, you know, you can't appoint Whitaker when Rosenstein's available, um, then it's not legal, and DOJ is 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 arguing that it's not legal. Um, and one of the one of the things I point out is that uh, Sessions' resignation is not dated, much less time stamped. Okay, okay, hold so on, d- hold on, hold on with Sessions not being dated. I just want to get into that dynamic about the OLC. Um, so 
the OLC, for people who don't recall, was the agency within um, the, uh, the the Department of Justice, uh, you know, the sub agency, I guess, that um, let's say the Bush administration went to and said, we need legal justification to torture. John, you wrote this up and, and, and whatnot. If the OLC writes it up, is it necessarily binding? Like, do, doesn't it still have to go to court at one point or... Or is that just a way to basically say the, the OLC is saying to the Trump administration, like, you have no legal standing. Like, you'll have to come up with a theory on your own because the government doesn't have one as to why it would be legal for you or constitutional, uh, I, I guess maybe legal because this is under a statute, right, to appoint Whitaker in this instance, right? It's, I mean, yeah, and they, they're pointing to an old, they actually are pointing to an old, old OLC opinion written by Ed Whelan, for those of you who remember Ed Whelan's role in the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation. Yes. Um, but but it, it isn't exact. It doesn't exactly follow to what we're looking at here. And um, the only time, you know, that, that people who know this stuff can think of where you had somebody in charge of DOJ who wasn't confirmed for for more than hours um, was during Watergate after right. Borg was firing people, and so it, you know it it's never happened before. There's no precedent, and you know with the White House is saying, well, there's this Ed Whelan opinion, but if if uh, Engel is re, re either did or is revisiting the issue, then that poses other legal problems, and it also gives Mueller an opportunity to say, and he's writing a memo about this right now as we speak, by the way, but um, it gives Mueller an opportunity to say to say the D.C. Circuit, oh, DOJ has told me that Whitaker is not a legal appointee, and therefore I'm still reporting to to the person who, in the absence of an attorney general, in the absence of a, 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 an attorney general who can do this, um, I'm still reporting to the guy that I'm supposed to be reporting to, which is Rod Rosenstein. And so this is one of the reasons I say we don't know what is going to happen. Um, I just have a hunch that something like this is going on. And, um, I, uh, and then there are the other questions about even if Whitaker was, uh, legally appointed. He's got all these conflicts. He's run a political campaign for one of the grand jury witnesses. He had all these statements before he was appointed, both attacking the Mueller investigation, but also saying, oh, sure, everyone would take the same meeting that Don Jr. took. Right. Um, and he, as I said, and he was interviewed to be part of Trump's defense team. So that is also problematic. So there's all sorts of uh, conflicts, not the least of which he was part of a company, I guess, that uh, was investigated by the FBI. He sort of didn't Still mention that. Still being investigated, as far as we know. Yeah, you know Still being things, investigated. Sometimes these things slip uh, slip the mind, Marcy. <laughs> um, and you, you forget about those things. But the real—so the, the long and short of it is, at the very least, regardless of how these uh, questions would be answered, what they do provide is— a grounds in which Mueller would contest any actions that Whitaker would take that would slow roll his investigation, that would defund his investigation, that would do anything else. Because he would then go, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just trying to understand how sort of the, this practically goes forward. He would then go to um, the, the D.C. Circuit and uh, I guess to a panel of three judges and say, you know, please enjoin him from doing this because... A, all of the things that are sort of public that we know about uh, make his hiring uh, invalid. And then, and B, uh, there's also, and there may be, this is hypothetical, a, an OLC uh, memo that suggests that his, his hiring's not valid, that he's not really the guy. So, I mean, is that how it would work? That's how it would play out if it goes down that route? Yeah, and it may, it may not go down that route. I mean, right, it may right. be that... It may be that um, on Thursday, Rosenstein said, you guys blew the resignation and we have until Friday to put stuff in place. Um, it may be that Mueller already has indictments sitting, waiting to be unsealed, and he's just kind of finishing with Jerome Corsi, among all people. Oh. Um, 
it may be that, you know, so, so there are a bunch of possibilities. We, you know, obviously Mueller's not telling. We'll find a couple of hints. As I said, he's writing a brief due on Monday, a week from today, um, in a subpoena challenge uh, of somebody close to Roger Stone. And um, that subpoena challenge was heard. The hearing was heard last Thursday. And there were some interesting things that Michael Dreeben, who um, – works for the Solicitor General, that he said, he basically said, well, we can indict somebody on our own. We can, you know, give somebody immunity on our own. We can do a plea agreement on our own. We can't subpoena a journalist on our own. So, you know, he was sort of laying out what he thought, uh, what he thought they could do without going to their superior, which may be Whitaker, maybe Rosenstein still, we don't know. Um, and, and that by itself was interesting, but the judges on that panel said, you know, they started that hearing by saying, let's pretend that what happened yesterday didn't happen. And then we're going to ask you to give us more briefing on on what you think that what did happen yesterday has an impact on this challenge. And so we'll we'll learn on Monday, if not before, what Mueller thinks his legal status is and how Whitaker's appointment changed it. So, um, you know, we we may not know until then, but we we should learn on Monday. Okay, so just to be clear, we are uh, pre-taping this on uh, Monday the twelfth. Between now and then, um, there's there there could be you know Mueller will have a better sense of his status. It's quite possible that uh, by you know midway through this week, because of the nature in which they solicited um, uh, Sessions' resignation, that. The statute in which they're operating under, which call, which applies if a guy like Sessions actually resigns rather than is forced to resign, um, nullifies Whitaker's uh, appointment and makes it too susceptible to legal challenges. So they have to basically do a do over or just give up the ghost on this on this plan. You mentioned the idea of 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 Mueller already having indictments. Will you walk us through? that like you know like it's almost a fail safe type of mechanism at least to the extent that you that that it, it exists we don't know that it does but that Mueller sort of may have anticipated a day like today or probably did uh and <laughs> he certainly did right, yeah. and and uh so what does that mean there are sealed indictments just walk us through what 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 would have happened up to this point if today there are X number of sealed indictments? Who would they be sitting with? Who could unseal them? Who could stop them from being unsealed, if anybody? Um, so we don't know whether this happened or not. And there's a lot of hoax, you know, there's a lot of rumors on the Internet claiming there are, you know, 100 sealed indictments. I would distrust that. But it is, in fact, true that, I mean, obviously Mueller anticipated something like this might happen. Um, the Friday before Election Day, he was really pressuring to get some witnesses against Roger Stone on the record. So just for example, it's possible he finished an indictment against Stone, um, had the grand jury vote to approve it, and then left it sealed. Um, and if that's the case, once the indictment is, as far as I understand it, once the indictment is done and sealed, then it no longer belongs to DOJ. It belongs to the court, and in this case, it would belong to the uh, to the judge overseeing the grand jury, which is the chief judge in D.C. Her name is Beryl Howell, uh, Obama appointee. She has been totally by the book, um, and I can envision her being, you know, the the next incarnation of John Sirica. So, so it would be up to her, um, and. And, you know, Mueller could go and ask to have it unsealed. One of the interesting things that happened, um, there's been a lot of talk about how Mueller sent parts of the investigation to other places, most notably the Michael Cohen uh, hush payment stuff to to Manhattan, basically. And that's a really independent U.S. attorney's office, and that's going to be as hard to fiddle with as fiddling with Mueller is just because, that's the culture of SDNY. Um, so that's one way that he, we know he protected parts of his investigation. Um, we know that Trump is being investigated in that. Trump committed campaign violations in that case. Uh, Wall Street Journal reported that the other day. 
The other thing um, that he did is three of his team members have already been spun back to their home departments. Um, and and they, they're they just there as, as protected employees of DOJ. And it's something Haywire went went to go on. And, and, and there's good reason to believe that they're continuing to work on related issues. They could then go to the court and say, we want these grand jury materials because they pertain to our day job. So they could free them, um, you know, once the House, once the Democrats take over in the House, um, okay. if things went really haywire, they could try and go get those grand jury materials. So there are ways to get that, uh, which right, is very just... different. Let me just recap, yeah. though, so that people uh, aren't lost, because there's a lot of information there. So, <laughs> okay, so so we don't know how many uh, indictments uh, Mueller has. We know that there's, I mean, it's been reported that there's if at any, least one or if two. Any. Isn't there, hasn't there been reports that there's at least one sealed indictment, maybe from a couple of months ago? I mean, is it possible that he would have, but, but let's just assume that we don't know. It could be anywhere from zero to, I don't know, whatever number. Let's just pick a number, 25 indictments. Yeah, I want to emphasize it could be zero, though. Okay. I really want to emphasize that. So it could be zero. and But if there were anything more than zero, they would be with the judge. You mentioned uh, Soraka. I didn't know how to pronounce his name, but this was just recently revealed that there was a basically a plan. The, the, is that who you're referring to, the judge from the uh, Watergate case? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and so and these were recently released by a... Um, I guess it was a FOIA, what, and I, and I want to ask you what you think about the timing of that, but just to cover where we, we just covered. Uh, so these indictments are there, and they could be unsealed. If, if Mueller was fired tomorrow by hook or crook, could you're suggesting that people from his team who have been re-embedded back in the DOJ could go to the judge, and there is basically a almost like a thread hanging from there from other stuff that they're doing that would unseal these indictments. Uh, or could could Mueller maybe not unseal it, but maybe pick up the prosecution in their home area. So one of the prosecutors who's been spun back is a woman named Kyle Free, and she's a money laundering specialist. So she's back, I think, in New York. And if Mueller was fired tomorrow, could she then pick up um, bribery and money laundering? Yeah, maybe. And she'd be in New York, and and it'd be a lot harder to screw with her. So. That's another possibility is that you've got these team members who know their portfolio. They're part of the portfolio. And even if you fired the entire Mueller team today, they'd still be there with the knowledge and with the ability to free up grand jury materials for further prosecution. Okay, great. Um, and um, uh, so, okay, so assuming all of that is there, and they have, how would Mueller... Could Mueller do anything with those uh, things, or is it just up to the judge at that point to say, like, okay, I'm watching this go down, and uh, it's time for me to unseal these um, these indictments? Well, somebody from DOJ has to ask to have them be unsealed. So, you know, um, it, it could be somebody from Mueller's team. Um, most of Mueller's people are DOJ employees, so they're actually harder to fire and they could go and say, we need to unseal these indictments. Again, if there are any, and I want to stress that there may not be, um, that that they could then... I mean, basically, somebody has to go to the judge and say, we gave you a good reason to seal these back on um, November 2nd when we, got, when we handed them up. Now it's time for us to unseal them. We're going to go arrest these guys. Um, and that's how it would work. But ultimately, it's Beryl Howells. It's the judge... It's her decision uh, to unseal, and it's her decision what happens with the grand jury materials, um, and that's something that could be litigated forever. But that's something, that's kind of the real fail-safe, that if everybody is fired, um, the House Judiciary Committee is going to come after those materials, and it would be up to Beryl Howell to decide whether or not to share them. All right, so let's let's just go down that road for a moment, too. Um is it possible that uh, the House Judiciary Committee uh, comes in, uh, whatever, January 22nd or something, they convene their first, uh, you know, they have their staff, and let's say Mueller is fired. Now, could they could they hire Mueller as a staffer? I mean, what? They're not going to. Okay. Um, they won't. Uh, they, um, you know, they, they, different committees, 
in the house are going to do different things. Um, Schiff is going to pick up a lot of the threads of the Russian investigation that were dropped by under Devin Nunes. So, right. you know, you should expect um, some attention into the finances. You should expect uh, witnesses who avoided testimony, um, like Hope Hicks. She was allowed to not answer all the questions, and she obviously knows a lot about the response to the June 9th meeting, for example. Um, so they'll bring them back, and they'll flush out certain other areas of the investigation. It goes to the House Ju- I mean, the reason the House Judiciary is important is because if there were an investigation of the president um, that might turn into impeachment, it, that goes through the House Judiciary Committee. And they're important. You know, that's where the Watergate precedent is is worthwhile. Um, in Watergate, what Jaworski did, what the prosecutor did was he um, said, OK, here's what I would do if I were going to impeach the president. Can't do that. So let me take the actions that I would impeach him for, put together, basically um, box up the information, the evidence I have for all of the actions the president took that I would impeach him for, and have the grand jury vote to share that information as a kind of freestanding report that makes no accusations. It just says, here's what the president did, and here's the proof. Um, have the grand jury vote to be able to share that with the House Judiciary Committee. That's what happened during Watergate. And I would imagine one of one of Mueller's um, attorneys actually worked on the Watergate team. We imagine that Mueller is taking certain lessons from Watergate. And I would imagine that he would at some point and possibly did before the election, thinking something like this might happen at some um, at some point do something similar, have the grand jury give him permission to share information with House Judiciary if it comes to that. So that's how House Judiciary would get the information. Um, Trump is worse than Nixon. Nixon actually okayed the sharing of that information uh, back in the day. And, you know, Trump, I would imagine, would fight it because Trump is Trump. Um, but, you know, then then Brett Kavanaugh will get to decide or something like that. I mean, look, ultimately... Um, some of the arguments that Trump is already making and that the appointment of Whitaker makes is that the, that the judiciary has no role, isn't a free, isn't a, isn't a, um, isn't a third branch of government with its own power to keep people in line and enforce the law. And that's the kind of stuff that pisses off judges and justices, regardless of what party. Um, and the Nixon precedent, I think, is a pretty solid precedent. I don't think you know, even this court is going to overturn it in substantial fashion. So that's sort of where we could be headed if things go really haywire. But who knows? Maybe Mueller will be able to work out the week. He'll go and indict Roger Stone, and then we'll be in business. Um, the release of that roadmap that you talk about, um, w- was that a coincidence? Well, what do you make of the timing of that? I mean, that, that, I mean that's quite a coincidence. And that was really... it came out right before... Yeah. I mean, who Look, who is it that released it exactly, and what do you what does that tell you about the the timing and whatnot? Okay, one of um, somebody who was on Nixon's defense team has been trying to get it released for years, and then um, Ben Wittes and Jack Goldsmith from Lawfare said, "Hey, let's go get it released." I'm not even sure if they knew of the other FOIA, so they tried to get it FOIA, but they tried to do it more urgently. And what was released was actually stuff that was already in the public record but released in the form that it was released in the roadmap. So in other words, there's still redactions in there, but at least it shows us how the roadmap worked, what it looked like. Um, And they did it. Uh, Ben and Jack did it uh, because of the Mueller investigation. So it's not, it's not, you know, it's not a coincidence. They did it for that reason. Right. That said, I'm sure that, I mean, like I said, Mueller has somebody on his team from the Watergate, investigation. So he would have that insight if he hasn't already gotten that roadmap. And I know of another key player in this whole process who obtained a copy of the roadmap um, before it was released in FOIA. So we may not have been able to see it, but at least one of the people who would need to see it had seen it um before it was released publicly. So there was somebody uh, associated with the team who was trying to conform what they were doing to this this previously designed roadmap 
the the notion that it was i mean obviously it's been there's been attempts to foyer this for a long time as you say do you think that the release of it was timed by uh, the releasing body was was it the archives or was it the doj that that had to release it and and um i, I want to correct i want to make something very clear please when i say that somebody else has gotten a copy of the roadmap i have no idea whether Mueller has seen a copy of the roadmap there were claims that ken Starr wanted it and never saw it all I'm saying is that, and I don't, and I'm not speaking, I'm not saying at all that I know what Mueller team, Mueller's team has done. They have somebody from the Watergate team on their team. So that's where their knowledge would definitely come. I'm saying somebody else, somewhere else in government was able to get a copy, and it's somebody that you and I would be happy had a copy uh, and was thinking in these terms ahead of the game. So that okay. also was happening before the roadmap was released publicly. It was released by the archives. Uh, with the approval of Daryl Howell. And this is this is also probably not a coincidence, but um, that FOIA case went to the chief judge in D.C. Again, Daryl Howell, who is overseeing the Mueller grand jury, and she is, because she's overseeing the Mueller grand jury, she's the one who would decide whether or not a report from the grand jury gets shared with the House Judiciary Committee. So, um, and she's the one who would like to be able to share the full roadmap. Um, what she did was approve, order basically, the archives to release whatever had already been publicly, publicly released. And she's waiting on a D.C. Circuit um, decision to, uh, uh, to decide whether or not she can release the rest of it. But, um, so what but does that that's do? Where that goes. Once it's public... I mean, assuming that, you know, there would be some vague awareness of that roadmap at the very least on a Mueller's team um, and uh, adding the notion that there's someone that you and I might appreciate was aware of it, too, so that they, you know, maybe can can, you know, provide some other sort of like uh, what is the what is what is the were they simply acting on like, OK, here's a FOIA and I'm going to release it or does it what does it do? To have that released publicly, does it just create more pressure of like create more of a of a structure to validate any actions going forward that may um, that 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 may follow that roadmap? Well, it's I mean it's fifty years, forty five years, so it's not we're not talking about the Mueller roadmap being released tomorrow. We're talking about um, we're we're really. When I say the fail-safe, we're talking about Mueller successfully sharing the results of his grand jury with the House Judiciary Committee, if it comes to that. Right. I don't even, ex you know, it... Uh, it may not come to I that. Expect, yeah, it may, well, I mean, I expect they'll ask. Right. Because I would ask. Um, but it, but it, it, there will be a lot more support to do that um, if, say, Mueller gets fired. Then there's going to be a lot of pressure to make sure that that happens. Whereas if Mueller is still working, they're not going to get anything. Um, and they probably won't ask. Um, and, and as I said, the committee that's going to do the most investigation on the Russia question right off the bat is going to be Schiff, the House Intelligence Committee, not the Judiciary Committee. So, you know, Judiciary Committee is going to investigate, um, they're going to investigate Whitaker's appointment. They're going to investigate the investigation into Kavanaugh, the vetting of Kavanaugh. Um, they're going to investigate Trump's use of the pardon power, but they're not going to investigate Russia per se unless something happens to Mueller, in which case they're the ones constitutionally have to. Okay. And so um, lastly, Jerome Corsi, maybe not exactly yeah. lastly, maybe not exactly <laughs> lastly, but I should just remind people, Jerome Corsi is the guy who wrote, who basically um, uh, built the swift boating of, of John Kerry, right? He's the one who who assembled the Swift Boaters, and he's a WorldNet Daily guy, I guess maybe not so different from uh, Roger Stone in that respect, uh, from that sort of same swampy environs. What has he got to do with this? Yeah. Oh, and don't forget, he's behind the birther. And he was also the birther guy, too. I mean, he's had a very yeah. esteemed yeah. career on the right. Um, but so what does he have to do with the Mueller investigation? So Mueller has been interviewing him for two months, and uh, he did a broadcast last week where he basically he made it clear that something was going down with the Mueller investigation and said he might not broadcast today, and I don't think he did. So he may be 
facing an indictment himself. My guess is what's going on is that um, when when Stone first gave excuses for how he knew that Podesta's time in the barrel was coming, he said, well, uh, that has to do with a report that Jerome Corsi did for me in August, in the same time period, August 2016. Um, but what's interesting, and I've laid this out, is that um, Steve Bannon and uh, um, Rebecca Mercer had a report on August 1st of 2016, so right after the DNC emails drop, where they basically say Hillary is the one with close ties to Russia. It was a crazy report, but they did it. Uh, you know, I think it's a really good question uh, why they had it ready on August 1st. They had been working on it since March. But in any case, um, that's in the background. One of the things they do in that report is attack John Podesta. For, for um, He served on the board of this company called Jewel. And Roger Stone has at times said that's what the time on the barrel comment was. At other times, he was saying that he was talking about Tony Podesta and his ties, we now know, to Manafort, but his ties to the Ukrainians. Um, but what's really interesting and what I suspect Mueller is after in part is that on October 6th, so this is the day before the Podesta emails start, after having not touched that jewel attack, the, the John Podesta has close ties to the Russians, he didn't touch that between August and October. On, on October 6th, the day before the emails dropped, Jerome Corsi picks that back up again. And then on, on the 11th, on October 11th, WikiLeaks releases emails that, oh, gosh, have to deal with Jewel. And so it's as if, and I think, it, I think um, there's good circumstantial evidence anyway, that Corsi and through Corsi or maybe through Stone, that Stone and Corsi learned back in August that the, that WikiLeaks had these emails and expected that they were going to come and waited on their their kind of magnification of this jewel attack until the emails came out. And they anticipated that the emails came out and they were talking about what the emails showed without even pointing to the emails. So my guess is that that's one, one good way to prove or to at least suggest Strongly, the Corsi and Stone, sometime in mid-August 2016, learned what WikiLeaks was going to release in October and learned specifically that an attack they had already launched on John Podesta would be not substantiated because these people are conspiracy theorists, right. but would have a tie to something that WikiLeaks was going to release right before the election. All right. So just so that people understand, you know, uh, Roger Stone uh, basically seemed to predict that something bad was going to happen to John Podesta right before these emails came out. He's trying to pretend like, oh, no, you're mistaken. I wasn't talking about that John Podesta or I wasn't talking about those emails. I was just saying, like, you know, October is always a tough time for the campaign manager or something, you know, whatever. Um, all right. Well, so what are the implications if, if Roger Stone knew uh, about these uh, release of these emails before before the public did? Is it just that he's lied about it to maybe to the FBI or to the grand jury, or is there something else that that uh, implicates? Well, it depends where they learned it from and what kind of discussions they had about the sequencing of the release of them and the timing. Um, you know, if they were legitimately conspiring, if they were um optimizing the release of those emails to fit the attack they wanted to make on John Podesta right before the election, then you then I think you're getting um, you're getting into conspiracy with the people who hacked and leaked the Democrats. Um, and that's where I think Mueller is going. On top of that, yeah, do I think that I mean if that's true, but I don't know that that's true, but you know that's my suspicion of one of the things that Mueller is investigating with Stone. Another thing with Stone, by the way, is Stone literally overnight changed his mind about who had done the hack. Um, and he did so uh, basically at almost the exact same time as this attack from Steve Bannon and, and Rebecca uh, Mercer. So basically August 1st, 2016, he wakes up one day and says, oh, yeah, you know, I believed it was the Russians up until today. But today I've discovered a 400-pound hacker in his mother's basement. 
And so on August 1st, he changes his mind. He says, it's you know, it's a hacktivist, um, which is sort of his cover story now. He was like, yeah, I was talking to Guccifer, but that, that guy's just a fat, a fat hacker in mom's basement. It's not a Russian sitting in, in, in Moscow. And so I think there's an interesting story to that. Um, and I have no idea what the answer is, but, um, I, you know, I suspect that's another area where where Mueller is going. Um, and... Uh, and then, yes, on top of that, uh, did Roger Stone lie to the House Intelligence Committee? Has Roger Stone, did Roger Stone develop an elaborate cover story back in March of 2017? And did Roger Stone threaten Randy Credico to back his cover story uh, at a time when Randy was being subpoenaed? And and those are, I think, some of the some of the gravy stories. And I also think. Um, the, this guy, Andrew Miller, who's fighting a subpoena, has said, I know nothing about Guccifer or WikiLeaks, but he did say, he did sort of suggest he might have some legal exposure on campaign finance issues. So it's possible that in the same way that Mueller has charged Manafort with other financial things, same with, um, you know, Manhattan and SDNY, charged Cohen with other things, it's possible that Mueller is going to throw on some campaign finance issues on top of these uh, to make things more difficult for Roger Stone. I don't know. I don't know. Um, all right. So, uh, and there was a report the other day that um, Junior is going around telling people he expects to be indicted. What, what's your take on that? Look, I think, um, the you know, Junior pretty clearly entered into conspiracy with Russians. Um, and so if Mueller is going to charge, a, uh, you know, I've argued a quid pro quo conspiracy, uh, the Russians promise dirt, and the Trumps promise sanctions relief. And Junior was at the center of that in a number of ways. So Junior is running around saying that he expects to be indicted for lying to Congress, which he probably did. Um, and again, that's House Intelligence testimony, and they're going to, I think, move more aggressively on that in January anyway. But um, but I also think he's at great risk for this conspiracy and he would be kind of a central player in that conspiracy case. So, um, so yeah, that's, you know, if, if he's indicted, I think that's also where you would go. Um, okay. And so, uh, lastly, let me just ask you the omnibus question. Is there, um, is there anything that you think that we should, we should know going into the next week or two where there could be, I mean, uh, and maybe this is sort of like make this a two-parter. What should we know, and what what is the range of things that we could expect happening over the next week or two as far as, you know, you would guess? Well, the range of things is um, Mueller gets fired, and Trump believes he has shut down the Mueller investigation, um, to Mueller rolls out indictments, uh, naming, say, Junior and Roger Stone and a bunch of other people. Um, and, and I think that that's the full range. But I also think, I mean, I think the most important thing is we don't know the answers to the most important questions yet. We don't even know whether Whitaker has been briefed and what Mueller is up to. We don't know that. Um, and so without that knowledge, we really don't know what's going to happen. What we do know is, yes, Mueller had every reason to expect something like this would happen. And uh, Mueller has been very good at keeping secrets, so I suspect Trump badly misunderstands how much he could do to undermine Mueller at this point. I mean, uh, somebody who is closer to all of this than I am told me that, you know, he, he doesn't think you can shut down Mueller. A lot of people don't think you can shut down Mueller at this point, and that may well be true. And even if you shut him down, there are other places where this investigation can, can crop up. So I guess my big message is, People, sh people should take what's going on very seriously. I do think it is a constitutional crisis. I do think the appointment of Whitaker was um, utterly cynical, um, ham-handed, may well backfire, but a clear indication that Trump uh, will go to great lengths to protect himself. Um, but I will also emphasize that um, Mueller and Rosenstein have a lot of cards to play and we haven't seen those cards yet and we should not we should not enter full panic mode we should make it very clear that we that that we take this seriously and i think the democrats are doing that um but i think it's 
still a little bit too early to panic. And but is there what I mean, if Trump does believe like, OK, the 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 horse is out of the barn and I, you know, I, I, I got um, uh, Whitaker in there because he, he told me he had a plan on how you would starve the investigation and it wouldn't cause any political turmoil because I would just cut his funding. And, you know, uh, Mueller's not going to go out there. He's not going to go on Jake Tapper's show and say that my funding's been cut or anything like that. Like. If if he realizes if Whitaker if the Whitaker plan gambit has failed and, and it, it appears like it it may have to a certain extent right I mean because now you know Whitaker's having to say publicly I'm not going to cut Mueller's funding I and mean, who knows he could lie uh, it's not like it would be hard for him to do that but like what what is what I mean what, it, what does he does does Trump have any moves he can he can have Mueller fired but if he thinks that the, he can't stop the investigation what else can he do. Well, he can start pardoning people. Right. I mean, you know, he could, if the witnesses against him, and this here's another thing that's, that, that is interesting, um, pre-taping on Monday, on, when, on Friday is Paul Manafort's first status report. And there was a report from ABC which said Paul Manafort actually isn't cooperating all that, all that nicely. Also sometime this week, um, I think that, the seizures, the, for, the seizures of, of Manafort's forfeiture start going into effect. We don't get the Trump Tower condo, which is really sad because, uh, frankly, he doesn't own it. Mm. But uh, uh, Manafort is forfeiting $46 million, take out the Trump Tower condo, and that's still $43 million of stuff to the federal government. And once he forfeits that, then, um, you know, Trump can still pardon him, but it you know, he's still screwed. Like, he still doesn't have the money to pay legal defense. He still will be um, prosecuted in New York and Virginia and Florida. So um, Manafort, you know, I said when he took the plea deal that it was not pardonable. Um, Technically, it still was, but things may take place uh, this week that get us much closer to the point where, where Manafort is not pardonable. Um, and, and that also is something that Trump may not, I mean, he could pardon Manafort today, right? But if it doesn't, uh, there's if it not going to be, if it doesn't have material election, benefit to Manafort, what's the point? Well, it, you know, it, 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 yes, there is limited material benefit and, um, possibly as soon as tomorrow will become a lot less material because he has, have lost everything, including the ostrich shirt. Mm. Um, but, um, but. But yeah, so Manafort is moving forward as well, and that that I think um, makes things more interesting. But but um, yeah, if that's if that's where Trump is at, the two other people he can pardon to buy their silence are Roger Stone and his son. Right. Well, and that may be his last line of defense if, in fact, Mueller is as far as we think as he could be. And uh, maybe he was sitting uh, like uh, I just have a vision of him maybe in the shower in Paris uh, in a ball in the corner, like one of those really dramatic scenes from a movie where he's like realizing he's starting to run out of moves. Uh, Well, and that's the thing about the Whitaker move is it was really incompetently done because it seems like you could have found somebody who um, Alex Azar, who uh, runs HHS, you could have moved him in. and and not had to deal with all of the problems that Whitaker brings, and he didn't do that. So in um, other words, they may have. It shouldn't be that hard for the Trump administration to find someone who has already been confirmed by the Senate who has absolutely no integrity and will do the president's bidding, <laughs> right? I mean, that's basically well, what it comes down to. Sort like, of. Although, I mean, Alex Cesar is under consideration to be the real AG right. once Whitaker, you know, hatchet jobs uh, um, Mueller. Uh, but it's also, I mean, one of the one of the other really interesting things about the meeting last week after Sessions was told he was going to resign. Um, in that meeting, I said this already. Uh, Rosenstein, his deputy, uh, the guy who decides whether or not the appointment was legal, and Noel Francisco. Now he's the Solicitor General. I said he's number three in office. Um, first of all, one sort of would suspect that if something really haywire happened, all those people would resign. Um, which would be a big deal. But the other thing is, remember when we were like, okay, he's going to fire Rosenstein? Right. And then the next in line will supervise Mueller? This was the, the next in the, line this, is Francisco. Right. 
And this was and so the Washington Francis Post. Francis was in that room figuring out how to protect the, the Russian investigation. So one of our fears, which is that Francisco would become Mueller's boss, actually probably isn't that big of a fear because he's on Rosenstein's side. He was trying to figure out how to protect the investigation. So the fact that it that they chose Whitaker indicates that maybe all those people that we were worried about are um, not willing to go the extra mile for Donald Trump. And and that moment when when Rod Rosenstein was fired was based on a Washington Post or I think it was a New York Times story that uh, told about uh, Rod Rosenstein joking around um, w uh, about uh, wiring uh, somebody to go in to talk to the president and there's some speculation that Whitaker was the guy who related that story. Maybe he heard that story and then he related it to the Times. Yes, I would bet a fair amount of money that he was one of the sources for the Times. Oh. So he tried to get Rosenstein fired in September and then uh, succeeded in getting his, his own boss fired in November. Um, had they gotten Rosenstein fired in September, that might have been adequate timing, but, but um, Noel Francisco would have been in charge. So, you know, um, it wouldn't have... Turns out Noel Francisco is not, not loyal. Not loyal. Well, look, I mean, these are, these are lifetime lawyers, right? right. And, and they may be... Inc I mean, it's like, look at George Conway, Kellyanne's husband, right? right. He's a re do, not, do not mistake him for a screaming liberal. But he is a lawyer, and he does believe in the law and the Constitution, and he has made now two arguments about the law and the Constitution that have been very unfavorable to Donald Trump, but that are what you would expect from an honest lawyer, even a conservative, in his position. And, and maybe that's where Francisco is. Maybe, you know, Francisco doesn't want, doesn't hope for this investigation into Trump, but recognizes that rule of law requires that the investigation proceed in a certain way. Marcy Wheeler, uh, folks, uh, you cannot do better in any uh, format, medium, uh, temporal or spatial uh, way of informing yourself about what's going on than to read uh, EmptyWheel.net. Marcy, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Sam. All right, folks. That's our interview for today. We're going to uh, head into the fun half of the program, wherein we will play some audio sounds and uh, some video and take your phone calls and answer your IMs. Let's put this up, though. Right now, I think I said at the beginning of the uh, program, the Democrats have picked up a net of, what did we say, 33 and there, it, it is quite possible, they're still counting in California uh, and in Georgia, one or two other places, that at the end of the final tally, there will be 40 plus, or I should say for, uh, a net gain of 40 House members uh, in the Democratic caucus. Yesterday, Josh Harder beat Jeff Denham in the San Joaquin Valley in California. Um, there are two other Republican seats that the counting seems to be going against them. One is um, in uh, Orange County. This is California 45, Katie P uh, Porter. I want to just speak briefly about uh, Katie Porter. I, I don't want my comments yesterday to be misconstrued. Uh, and David Dayen had a, uh, a very good um, uh, thread on this and specifically a piece that he wrote about uh, Katie Porter's role in making California responsible for something like 40 percent of all recoupments on 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 bad mortgage shenanigans, mortgages that had no underlying documentation as to the uh, debt owed and um, the, the sec securitization, the lien against the house. Um, and she was personally responsible for for helping out um, thousands of homeowners as a uh, basically working for uh, out of uh, Kamala Harris's uh, office. Um, and you know, Dayan spent a lot of time, obviously, probably more than 
more than mo certainly most, and wrote a great uh, uh, book on it, uh, Chain of Title, on that aspect of the mortgage crisis. So uh, despite the fact that she sort of ran to the middle, um, it, you know, she was doing so in Orange County, which is a, uh, I don't know if they've had a Democratic uh, representative there in decades, but uh, nevertheless. And so, uh, so far we have um, images of the de members elect. Now, Republicans, I think they flipped two or th two or three seats and uh, then of course there was also um some retirements uh and whatnot so uh there are about let's see one two three um let's say i don't know about 25 30 republican members elect there you can see the pictures of them all there is one woman amongst them and uh, one guy, that guy who uh, was on Saturday Night Live, uh, who has an eye patch. That eye guy. patch guy. Yeah. Eye patch bit. Uh, now, eye patch guy. I bring that up not because I'm, I'm mocking his eye patch, but I'm looking, for, I'm looking for some measure of diversity. We have one woman, a woman out of those uh, 35 or some odd people and uh, one guy with an eye patch. And then, you know, to be fair... There's at least uh, two guys who seem to be completely bald and then a lot of guys with receding hairlines. And then uh, and also, to be fair, there's um, at least two or three guys who have facial hair. Are some guys not wearing suits. So there are. There are two people, three people, not, four people not wearing suits. So there's a lot of diversity there. Uh, you have a lot of I these patch men, guy coming through. You have all these uh, white men. Some have uh, some are balding. Um, a couple wearing glasses. Some are pirates. One has an eye patch, and one uh, one of those white people is a is a woman. Let's go down and take a look at the uh, Democratic missed, members. I think no, the eye patch. That was a good lie. You made yeah. one of them's a pirate. I mean, did the Trump <laughs> voice. Come on, that was good. Pirate. And then you look at the Democratic members elect, and it it is just a, it's like a completely different place. Scary. Um. We have uh, multiple African American folks. We right. have uh, um, uh, folks who are. Uh, I see at least four people that might blow up the new Congress in a suicide bombing. Yes, there is um, uh, uh, um, a Muslim uh, exactly. a woman, and uh, there Mike, is a, she's gonna hug you in detonator vest. Is is the woman from uh, Minnesota Ethiopian or Eritrean? I think no, Ethiopian. neither. She's Somali. Oh, Somali, um, and uh, in them. We have, uh, I mean, we have men and women. Uh, I think the predominant uh, are, are women. Uh, it is pretty striking <laughs> that those two. Uh, Not a single eye patch. Now, so Not you one. look at this and I ask you, which party, which party um, is based on identity politics? Like, what is the identity of the Democratic members elect. I couldn't. What is the one identity that you can you can state about that? They all make me want to cross the street. No. All right. To be fair, <laughs> I got to no, watch my wallet. No eye patches. I just said that. No <laughs> eye patches. Not a single no representation. Pirates. So why is this party so big? And scroll back pirates? up to the to the Republicans. I mean, this is, you know, like whenever you hear someone say that Democrats are about identity politics. Look at this and tell me which party is about an identity. It's just absurd. It is an absurd talking point. The, in fact, the talking point itself refutes the talking point. There is no identity, identity. that can uh, right. encompass the 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 democratic at least incoming members of, of here's Congress. one one might mug you one might suicide bomb you how about that that's two what do you have yeah. against vets is what do you have why question. do you hate vets that's my question <laughs> there you go <laughs> i think there's some vets in uh, the democratic vets there. who love america well, but don't hate america i guess this speaks to the bad 
things about the both sides argument, right? Because they both do identity politics to some degree, but the Republican version is like, everyone should be white. And the Democrat version is not everyone needs to be white. Well, the reality is everyone does and everywhere does identity politics in some fashion or another, right? And, uh, but the reality is when you look at this, um, there is, I mean, to the extent that I even know what identity politics means, right? That you take your cues and you vote uh, based upon, you know, I guess what the identity of a certain person is. There's no consistency amongst the Democratic Party, right? Like there's, it's clear that there is not, there can't be a defining characteristic of an identity that is, um, uh, that is the, the catalyst for your vote. I could give you a defining characteristic. None of these people could get an apartment in any of my buildings. Well, how about right. that? Well, There's the a defining... white guy could. Well, it's probably. Good. I don't know. We'll see who he associates with. All right. Uh, um, so, just wanted to put that up. Whoa! He has an eye patch. The other. He's with us. <laughs> <laughs> That's bad luck. The other. Um, we'll talk more about this in the uh, fun half. About the Republicans are now. Uh, Ro Kahana has a um, a War Powers Act resolution um, bill that has been submitted. It is a privileged rev uh, resolution because of the nature of the War Powers Act. The Republicans are attempting to vote to make it unprivileged, uh, basically to defang the War Powers Act so that they don't have to take a vote on Yemen. And uh, we will talk more about that. The Democratic uh, Party, more or less. I mean, I imagine there's some that aren't, but uh, the leadership certainly is unified in this. Uh, we will take a quick break, head into the fun half, 646-257-3920. It's going to have to be a short one today, but uh, we will have it nevertheless. Oh, uh, just a reminder, quick plugs, everybody, today. You can become a member of the Majority Report by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Last night was TMBS. Malika Jabali, the color of economic anxiety and a deep dive into Amazon voter suppression on Friday. ContraPoint, get your tickets to the Bell House show. And don't forget uh, what I am you, uh, Sam. Oh, right. Thank you. So this week on the Antifada, we still have our episode out with Jay Firestone, who infiltrated the alt-right in New York. We also have an episode forthcoming about the Greek debt crisis, as well as a bonus about some uh, good riot stories from Greece. Also, Sean is recording an episode of Pod Damn America today, where he does a history of the IWW, and that should be out tomorrow. So check it out. Matt. Uh, literary Hangover, Catherine Maria Sedgwick. Uh, more and more people are talking about her because of the episode <laughs> we did this week, uh, bringing her back, uh, bringing her novel back, uh, Hope Leslie, about the Pequot War and uh, a lot of different things with patriarchy and slavery in Massachusetts colonial times. Also, don't forget, you can buy tickets to uh, the live Majority Report happening on January 13th, Sunday afternoon. 18 and over at the Brooklyn Pod Fest at uh, you go to majority.fm for more information. Folks, don't forget Calming Comfort by Sharper Image. It's the luxurious weighted blanket that mimics the soothing feeling of being hugged. So you can sleep better, feel great, and stress less. The Calming Comfort weighted blanket comes with a 90 day anxiety free, stress free, best night's sleep of your life guarantee from Sharper Image. Right now, for Majority Report listeners, go to CalmingComfortBlanket.com. Use the promo code MAJORITY at checkout. Receive 15% off the displayed price. That's CalmingComfortBlanket.com. Promo code MAJORITY. Because you can't put a price on a great night's sleep. It's real. It's a nice feeling. Sweetheart. Sweetheart. Get me a beer. I totally get it. They are. You turn on the TV, some iteration of me. Zero sum game. It's a nice feeling. Zero sum game. Zero sum game. It's a nice feeling. You're going to lose your status. He's the king of his zero sum game. I totally get it. Zero sum game. They are. Zero sum game. Sweetheart, get me a beer. 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 Get me
me a beer. Get me a beer. We are back. Sam Cedar, fun half. Look at how quick we get transitioned into the fun half today. It's pretty good. Um, what? Uh, oh, here we go. Sher Brown um, makes a point of pointing out the obvious here, which is that in the context of Georgia, you had the Secretary of State personally disenfranchising voters and shutting down voting uh, voting stations in an election that became incredibly close. And Sherrod Brown, who I believe is going to be one of the many people on the Democratic side who may be throwing his hat or her hat into uh, the contest to become president, um, was at the National Action Network uh, talking about that race in Georgia. Gun lobby, populists don't appeal to some by pushing others down. That, that's why I say in America we will never give up the hallowed ground of patriotism to the extremists at our state house, Joyce, and the extremists in this White House. And we also will never give in, as Senator Cardin said, we'll never give in on voting rights. Uh, we have seen what, if Stacey Abrams doesn't win in Georgia, they stole it. It's clear. It's clear. And I would say, I say that publicly, it's clear. What they're trying to do in Florida to the gubernatorial candidate and to the Senate candidate running for re-election. What they tried to do in Ohio with some success by voter purging. What they did in Georgia when they shut down rural precincts that were predominantly African Americans where many people simply don't have transportation to get to the polls. That's what they do. They can't win elections because there's way more of us than there are them. They can't win elections fairly. They win elections by redistricting and re apportionment, in voter suppression, in all the ways they try to scare people, particularly people of color, how they make it hard for people in college campuses, especially community college where there are more low-income people and more people of color. We know those despicable laws are often aimed that way. We must make sure, obviously, that every vote's counted in Georgia and Florida. And every all right, there you have it. And um, the Democrats are going to be introducing, at least in the House, um, Bills that would reinvigorate Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act to institute motor vehicle uh, automatic registration, uh, a series of, of voting reforms, including offering an amendment to repeal Citizens United. Um, this, of course, will not pass the Senate, but it will put... Um, some pressure on some Republican senators to the extent that they can feel pressure from normal human beings. In other words, those who are not um, living in a state that is uh, incredibly red, as it were. Um, but Shar Brown's statement is also self-evident. There are, in fact, more Democratic voters than Republican voters. They are not um, they are not district in a way that provides us with the results that are reflective of that disparity. You had significantly more Democratic votes than Republican votes nationally in terms of Congress. Uh, obviously, uh, that ended up being a net 40 difference. But when Republicans won 65 vote, 65 net pickups in 2010, they did so with significantly less votes than Democrats had in this election. And uh, same too, 94. Just uh, the district redistricting his, is in such a way that it, it mitigated the size of the Democratic wave, but 40 by any definition is a wave. That's just the reality of it. Um. While we're talking about the uh, diversity of our, oh, let's go to uh, Ainsley um, Earhart. Uh, this was just from the other day on Fox and Friends. You know, it's, it's not just that taking time, 
the time it takes to count all the ballots, the absentee ballots in close races, the provisional ballots. It's not just that that is obviously and self-evidently uh, evidence of fraud, because why would you keep counting ballots after the day that they were cast? <laughs> but there's another problem with it, too. It's just not fun. And I think part of the fun of voting and having your voice heard is finding out on election night. We all stay up really late to see what these votes, what, what, when they come in and when these uh, races are called. If you aren't, or you're still counting votes after 10 days, and I understand if it's super close, you it's have to close. do that. And it is down there. But if you're still counting votes, if they change it for going forward, we're still counting ballots 10 days after. It kind of takes the fun out of election night. Yeah, too. well, I'm willing to take the fun out to get it right, though, Angel. Right? Well, and we should just go if back to really election day being election day. Ultimately, though, when Brian Kilmeade is the voice of reason, dude, and there gentlemen. is a trend you here. You know you have a problem. There's a bizarre trend with Kilmeade. That's not he, a bizarre trend. No, he's just is. sitting there going like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire right, life. Right, so just and repeat that back there. to yourself. Brian Kilmeade sitting there and going, this is the dumbest thing of my entire life. He's done that three You're or four times to now. Make that it's a, a bizarre reflection of yeah, you Kilmeade. Had to correct him about uh, something really unwoke that got said about yeah. uh yeah. But about who? But, Iranians. But you're having to but Yeah, he did the thing with Lindsey Graham. You're crediting Kilmeade as opposed to discrediting Ainsley. Uh, oh, I see no contradiction. I would she, chart a third way. That is She's a total moron and uh Kilmeade by standards of Kilmeade, I give him a little credit. I'm sorry. Like even a like a fourth grader couldn't come up with that something that stupid well now why you got to insult fourth graders i'm not insulting fourth graders i'm just saying that there's actually like a physiological lack of development of the brain of kids that age they have not been exposed to a uh you know uh decades uh, multiple decades worth of of information to to be on a to be talking about politics and sort of bemoan the fact that it takes that long to because it's not fun. And it's like, well, that's part of the reason why you vote, because it's fun to find out. Well, we know she doesn't really believe that. She just can't say we don't want to count the votes because that would hurt Republicans. I'm not convinced of that. Would it really? Oh, yeah. I think she actually really <laughs> she does actually believe that. Believe I think it. she's really, really dumb. It, it I think goes, she's getting creative. It goes into, it reminds me of how, um, you know, my family, we open presents on Christmas Eve. Uh, which is a bit early, but I, me and my brother had just worn down my parents so much. And I'm with Ainsley. Like, I want to open up the ballots as soon as they're <laughs> submitted. Like, what are we waiting for, though? Like, let's Why? Get the fun. We could probably just do this much easier with a show of hands. Um, but then we move from the uh, sublimely moronic to the more consciously... Um, cynical and uh, malignant, and then of course I'm talking about Matt Schlapp on uh, on Fox and Friends with Brian Kilmeade. Now Kilmeade will entertain this one a little bit more than uh, Ainsley. What's her name? Earhart saying it's just not fun Ainsley when you Earhart. have to count all the ballots. Well, uh, Matt Earhart, Schlapp, folks, we said it. Incidentally, this is the guy who uh, said the only reason why Michael Steele was named uh, RNC head was because he was black and then tried to explain to Michael Steele, like, you can't take offense at that, man. I wasn't. Stop getting triggered. <laughs> yeah, stop getting triggered uh, by that. They they were friends. I'm not sure if they still are. But here is uh, Matt Schlapp um, accusing or, or claiming that a state mandated recount in a state that is run by Republicans constitutes Democrats test run for stealing elections. I know some of these counties responsibly realized how close it was and by uh by their state constitution. They, got, they know their recount happened, so they quickly started recounting again through the machines. We know what happened in Palm County. They overheated, and they got to go through again because one for Senate, one for House. Uh, so it's a problem, so it's going to be delayed. Are you concerned? Uh, what concerns you most about this process? Pause it. So well, there it is. Like, are you concerned? And even Kill Me realizes, like, oh, I haven't set up anything nefarious whatsoever. I better make this an open-ended question. Process. What concerns me most about this process is, is that 
at the very beginning is where a lot of the wrong wrongdoing could have occurred when the election commissioners didn't follow the law explicitly and say how many ballots they still had to count. It, and, and then they took the counting behind closed doors and didn't let people like you in from the media. It created a question mark in all of our heads. Pause it. What? You know there are there are uh, county electors from both parties. You know that, right, Matt Schlapp? Of course you do. You also know that in the panhandle of Florida... There was a county affected by a hurricane that contravened Florida law and allowed people to fax in and mail in their ballots. Now, personally, I have no problem with that. I think the point is you want as many people to vote as possible and make it as easy as possible and have the flexibility to deal with those type of things. But that's not what Matt Schlapp is worried about. He's worried about the fact that Brian Kilmeade was not allowed into the area they were counting ballots like Brian Kilmeade is in every other county and district in the country where he's allowed in there to to watch them count the ballots. It created a question mark in all of our heads. What are they doing behind those closed doors? Maybe they're and counting. that is the biggest problem. We'll never know how they handled uh, all types of ballots, including ballots that were illicit. Ballots that were not legally cast. We'll never know. We're going to spend a lot of time in court. Pause we'll it. What does that mean? Ballots that were not legally cast. What does that mean? It's if, all the absentee ballots from the caravan. If they, if they go, what they're doing now in Florida is they're going through a mechanical recount. If the margin in the Senate race is, um, after that recount, still within 0.25, and right now it's at 0.2, they will then do a hand recount. And during that hand recount, there's a significant mon a number of undervotes in the senatorial race, some also overvotes. Only the undervotes, those are ballots that are there that do not have a vote for the Senate, but do have votes for other offices. They look at those and they see, did the machine not pick it up yet? And that's where you'd want you know, uh, understandably, because there's a subjective analysis. People around, that's all the pictures we saw, the hanging chads. They don't have hanging chads now. They just have other problems, apparently. Um, but they're making this up. They're making it up. That's the... We're going to spend millions of dollars. We're going to waste a lot of time. I believe at the end of this, Governor Rick Scott will be a senator. Uh, Ron DeSantis will be the governor. But the, what the Democrats are trying to do here, this is a trial run to figure out what they do in 2020 when Donald Trump is on the ballot. You watch. They are learning lessons so that they well, can do everything possible to stop him in 2020. And if we that is uh, just bizarre. It's going to come down to Palm Beach again, I guess, in 2020. Yeah, they created a question mark in our heads that wasn't there before. <laughs> that's the uh, that's the white news. White news. Sit down. Sit down, white news. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Get the uh, call, call screening. Devil Schlap, Devil Schlap. I call him he Devil Schlap. He is Schlapp. Yakubian. Oh, he's, he's like, absolutely Yakubian. He got his twenty-three and me back, and he's pure Yakubian. He is pure <laughs> Yakubian. He is pig grafted from a mad scientist in a cave, no question. Call him from a three-three-six area code. Who's this? Uh, hey, is this Sam? Yes, it is. Oh, dude, this is so awesome, Sam. I watch your show all the time. This is uh, Danny. I'm calling from uh, the Coastal Carolina area. Danny from the Coastal Carolina area. Uh, let's keep it. Uh, let's keep it pretty vague, Danny. What's uh, What's on your mind? <laughs> uh, it's cool. Well, uh, I just wanted to talk really quick about the uh, about this uh, this narrative of uh, liberal media bias. You know, I see that. Um, you know, everybody is always assuming that the the media is just always in it for the Democrats and that they're just, uh, you know, super liberal, even though they're really like more pro-establishment then. But when I look at shows like Hannity and Ingram, I mean, like Donald Trump literally has two hours of uh, ads every night for him. I mean, he, he literally has Three. two Fox anchors. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess I guess you could say the other ones on Fox too that are like literally defending him no matter what. And I just wanted to bring up really quick. I saw this example 
that I was surprised that nobody talked about like when it came up. I didn't see anybody like known talking about it. But Hannity uh, was for the Iraq War, and Hillary she also voted for the Iraq War, and we know that Trump uh, at first he was for the Iraq War, even though he tried to lie about it and say that he wasn't when that whole uh, thing came up during the debate. Right. And I saw in these videos around that time, Hannity is literally criticizing Hillary for supporting the war and defending Trump for not supporting the war, even though he disagreed with Trump and defending him for lying about it and saying that Trump was still right and criticized Hillary for being wrong, even though he agreed with Hillary and going to the war. Danny. And like the Danny. mental gymnastics you have to do for that is insane. Danny, <laughs> listen. Uh, I, are you sitting down? No, they're not. Are you sitting down? Yeah. All right, buddy. Yeah, I am. I got to tell you something. Sean Hannity does not have any okay. integrity. <laughs> uh, I hope that does not come as a... There is nothing. There is nothing Sean Hannity wouldn't reverse himself on, wouldn't lie about, exaggerate. There's nothing. There's this nothing. This is so deep. It's a deep state. Yeah. And there... There is nothing. And um, a, he literally works for Donald Trump. I mean, he doesn't get paid. Yeah. Bill Shine, his best yeah. buddy from Fox, does get paid and works for Trump. But Hannity yeah. works for Trump. He advises Trump. It's well known. It's well reported. Both he and Ingram have shown up at campaign events. Um yeah, it's absurd. And there is nothing, there is no yeah. equivalent to what exists with uh, with Fox. And, you know, just to go back to the interview that we had on Monday, uh, Yoki Bentler, um, Yochai Bentler, uh, they, they have done a lot of research about, uh, the, about these things. And so, yeah, I mean, it's... Yeah. Um, Sean Hannity is never going to have integrity, so uh, I would not. Uh, yeah. I would not get too hung up on that. But I appreciate the call, Danny. Yeah, thank thanks. It's super easy if you have no integrity. You just go. You just do it. Call from a two one five area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Two one five. Two one five. Gonna turn your computer off. Two one five. Sean doesn't care because he's a fucking man. <laughs> Calling from an 847 area code. Who's this? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Chris from Indiana. Chris from Indiana. What's on your Hello? mind? Hello? Yeah, um, what, yeah. Uh, one of the things I've been actually with the whole Whitaker, with the whole Whitaker situation that I've been kind of puzzled about because it seems, I don't know, a little obvious to me, but I'm again, I'm not a, a lawyer or anything. But nobody really seems to be talking about whether or not Whitaker is already guilty of conspiracy to commit um, to uh, to commit obstruction of justice. Because I mean, the plan he laid out in CNN was straight up obstruction. I mean, he gave intent and everything. He's just like, "Hey, I'm gonna we're gonna defund the Mueller investigation to end it." And Trump may have been able to get away with that if, like, it was just somebody normal who, and they could have played coy about why Mueller was getting. Uh, def, you know, defunded. But the problem seems to be a huge problem. Seems to be that Whitaker just gave up the game already, and he's been hired. And uh, just seems. I me mean, the argument I've seen people raise that the argument that I've heard is he was working in a different capacity at that time, and he was just giving his opinion yeah, on but, a show, and, uh, and 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 that's it. Now, there's also it's clear that he's been to the White House multiple times. There are reports that he was doing an end around on the Department of Justice. I mean, these things are all, though, allegations, right? Like the only thing that we know in terms of like fact that is indisputable is he never got a Senate confirmation. Uh, there's even Maryland didn't seem to bring up the fact that Jeff Sessions clearly stated in his resignation letter that you asked for this letter of resignation. There's another term for that. It's called, you fired me. Uh, and if Jeff Sessions was fired, then you cannot replace him with a, uh, you cannot replace him under the, the act that calls for acting, um, um, uh, you know, heads of, uh, of agencies. Now, there's also an argument that 
the Department of Justice is a specific type of agency in terms of its uh, close proximity to the power of the president that you can't have anybody uh, sitting there who hasn't been confirmed by the Senate for a similarly situated role. So the fact that they... Yeah, uh, I under. I understand all. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely understand all. There the are people it's who are making. Me, the, there are people who are making the argument that you're making, and you know, uh, commentators are, are are definitely talking about that. But the but but from a legal perspective, you know, that's a, that's one of those like you and what army type of situations uh, that you're you're referring to. I, I know. Mean, I mean, generally, the it seems generally the hard part about conspiracy usually is proving intent that somebody actually made the plan because I mean. It's illegal to, to plan to agree with somebody else, even if you don't know their full identity, to commit a crime in the future. You can't, right. like, you know, say, for instance, talk to somebody, hey, I'm gonna, we're going to rob this bank, you know, on Tuesday. You've already committed a crime if the two of you have made that agreement. I mean, that's been – so, I mean, that's where I start wondering about the whole conspiracy thing is that, you know, Whitaker's gone on TV said, hey, here's this whole plan to obstruct justice. And it just makes it wonder, like, well, I, Chris, me, I, I wouldn't, know. It seems listen, like it it wouldn't a... surprise me if Mueller is not adding to his list of evidence of obstruction and of intent to obstruct if this entire episode isn't part of that. That firing. Yeah, I mean, uh, you're Sessions. right. I, I mean, look, we know why Trump fired Sessions, right? Like, there's nothing yeah, we that do. Sessions is that's... doing that is not aligned with Trump's agenda, except for the fact, and Trump has said this multiple times publicly that sessions oh i know yeah i'm firing him because he recused himself in the investigation yeah, shut a little thing called not protecting my criminal activity <laughs> so it's there quite, are some disagreements it's quite possible that all of this is going to be part of an indictment at one point or, or at least in a report but and i've heard people re reference it i just think that at this point there the people are focusing on stuff that is actionable at the moment where you can actually go to court and say, uh, here is a, uh, we don't need to argue about the, the facts in this case. We simply need to argue the law. And so that's, that's what's going on. Appreciate the call. Hey, I mean, I, I would, I guess, okay, thank you. All right. I can't, I can, man, I can't fix all of it. I can't. What did Jeff Sessions? Yeah, slight difference of the agenda. The attorney general not protecting the president's criminal activity. What kind of bullshit you, is that? You go to a dumb Watergate with the bad lawyers you have. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty you do fun. Stupid Watergate with. <laughs> you don't choose the lawyers. You have them. This is uh, Mehdi Hassan. He's on what is it? Uh, AJ Al Jazeera streaming yep. or Al Jazeera uh, English? English global uh, news and. Is this the one that's exclusively online, or is this online? And I don't, I can't remember. Oh, no, now these are. I think they are available on some cable oh. packages. Yeah. So Mehdi Hassan um, has on Steve Rogers, who is a um, an advisor on the board of ad advisors, I guess, to Donald Trump's 2020 campaign. Best people. And um, you know, it just he wasn't prepared for all the questions that were about stuff. Here we go. The president lies daily, multiple times. When he says we're the only country in the world where a person comes in and has a baby, and that baby is essentially a citizen of the United States, is that true or false? No, it's false. It's a misstatement. That mean, doesn't a mean it's a lie. Okay. Okay. Uh, he said there were riots going on in California against illegal immigration and so-called sanctuary cities. Uh, were there any riots in California? Oh, yes, there were. There were a lot of civil disturbances. Where were the a riots? Lot, where were the riots? Can you tell me where Oakland, they were? Oakland, California. There was there were street skirmishes in um, Los Angeles. Oh, yeah, no, that's a no, fact. The I, no, 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 hold on. A, the spokesman for the California Police Chiefs Association says there was no, there were no riots taking yeah. place as a result of sanctuary city policy. There were no riots. He just made it up. When he was asked to say where they were, he said, go look for them. I can give you many more. He said during the campaign that there's six to seven steel facilities that are going to be opened up. There are no. U.S. Steel has not announced any facilities. Why did he say they've announced new facilities? That's a lie, isn't it? No, it isn't, because there are, there are a lot of companies opening up. There are steel facilities that are going to be opening up, or I think no, no, they, they sorry, actually want sorry, to Sorry, Stephen, that's not what he said. I know, you, I, I, I know it's difficult for you. I know you want to try and defend him. But he no, said, it isn't difficult well, for okay, me. Well, OK, let me read the quote. <laughs> let me read the quote to you. U.S. Steel just announced that they're building six new steel mills. That's a very specific claim. U.S. Steel have not announced six new steel mills. They have said they have not announced six new steel mills. There's no evidence of six new steel mills. He just made it up. And he repeated it. He didn't just say it I once. <sighs> Look, I don't know of what context these uh, <laughs> statements were made, but I could tell you this. The president of the United... I said 
what I'm about to say is not true. The U.S. Steel is opening up six. Th- That's the part they take me out of yeah, context. Yeah, Medi doesn't say that. What I said right before that is, I wish what I'm about to say were so. <laughs> In an ideal universe, what I'm about to say would be true. Now let's go ahead. Medi lies about lies it. Lies about because it. Because he's a fake journalist. Yes. The President of the United States has been very responsive to the American people, and the American people are doing well. You, look, they, that's people fine. can look can, at me and American say, Steve Rogers lied. Well, and the President can be a liar. There's no contradiction between those two statements. I, I am not going to say the President of the United States is a liar. No, I know I'm you're not, not but I've that. just put to you a multiple right. lies, and you've not been able to respond to any of them. Let me ask you this. I didn't uh, respond to them. What didn't happen is you didn't hear what you wanted to hear. What did that's I want to hear? Happen. I wanted to hear that there are no steel you, you mills. Wanted, you just they wanted to hear me say... No, not, well, let's go on. <laughs> I mean, you want to go on because you know it's a lie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there, is, there, is there anything better than someone with a British accent? Yeah, nothing. Um, uh, like pressing people on stuff like that? Yeah, nothing. that's how most interviews should be in the quote-unquote liberal media. But the creepy part is they can get caught in lies on lies and lies, and it's not going to change any of their supporters' minds. Not at all. Not at all. Um, it is. It will of, alienate, like th- clear thinking people. It though. alienates certain people, and in some ways, it's like a but war are there of attrition. Clear thinking people who are going around going like, I wonder if Donald Trump is a liar. I think the reason Republicans are so unpopular generally is because this is all they do, and it right. just takes time for people to catch up. Well, to I think there's also that. Uh, I think that's true too. That's actually chapter five of my Blame the Voters book. Um, there are plenty of clear thinking members of the ruling class who are very comfortable with the lies and the choices that they've made. Look, I cut your taxes, so let me have a couple of lies. Here is Mike Gundy. <laughs> a fucking um, hero. You know nothing about it, Samantha. I really don't. I don't. Um, I don't follow. Uh, don't follow uh, the Big Twelve. The Big can't 12. All be, what, Yeah, what uh, can't all be figure in? skating? Can it, Samantha? Yeah, right. I mean, I don't even. I mean, is this this guy? Uh, you know, a football coach? Is that what they do? They like Oklahoma they, State University Cowboys. Yeah. Now the Cowboys. I don't. I I do not follow college football. I just don't. Because um, you know, you grew up in the Northeast. It's not like you have any big powerhouses yeah, of, uh, true. I didn't think of college football. Boston College? Well, you know, Holy Cross, they were actually, uh, we, there was a guy, I can't remember his name, but this is beside the point, but he, he, he went, bo- Gill, somebody went, um, played defense and offense. And Holy Cross used to be big in basketball. Like if you go back to the early 70s, wow. they were top 10. Um, nevertheless, um, here is Mike Gundy. Now, I suspect that if Mike Gundy and I sat down and have a beer, he wouldn't like me <laughs> at all. But here he is somehow uh, not only making like sort of a category error, like he, has, he doesn't like a generation and he thinks it's because their uh, they're, they're political inclinations, but also it may just turn out to be that he's just a jackass. Uh, this is uh, Mike Gundy doing his uh, monologue from the play, Hey, you kids, get off my lawn. Is that the biggest difference in players these days? It seems like transferring is a lot easier to, a lot, e- a lot easier for guys to do than maybe it was back in the day. Pause it. Now, my understanding is, and I don't know what the rules are today, but uh, I know that back in the day, if you transferred, you were blue-shirted. For a year, you had to wait a year. Now, I don't know if that's the case anymore, but if that's the case now, that's a function not of the students, but rather of the, uh, is that right? Did I have that right, Brendan? Okay, so that was a rule change that took place because um, the National Collegiate Athletic Association wanted to make more money. That was a purely conservative capitalist move that disregarded the education needs of the students and said, you know what? We've got this free labor and we're not maximizing it. We're actually inhibiting the value to all of us. So that's the story of 
why students transfer now to different schools. They go to a school that has maybe a, a lesser quality football program, and then they go to one that has a better quality football program because they prove themselves at the lesser quality uh, program school, or maybe they, maybe they want to get closer home. Who, who knows? But this was all done by the NCAA to make more money. So here we have, I'm sure, Mike Gundy is going to blame the organizations that are supposed to protect students. was back in the day. Well, I think we live in a world where people are noncommittal. We, we allow liberalism to say, hey, I could just do what I want and I don't have to really be tough and fight through it. And you see that with, with mm -hmm. young people uh, because it's an option they're given. We weren't given that option when we were growing up. We were told what to do. We did it the right way or um, you go figure it out on your own. In, in the world today, there's a lot of entitlement. Uh, I'm a firm believer in the snowflake. I think it's, it's setting there. And I'm not talking about Tabo. Tabo and I have had multiple good talks. I'm talking about every millennial young person, Generation Z, I think is what they call them. Um, that's the world we live in because if they say, well, it's a little bit hard, then we say, okay, well, let's go try something else versus, hey, let's, let's bear down and let's fight through this. So you see a lot of that nowadays. And that doesn't have anything to do with Tabo or McCleskey or anybody that's been on the portal here. That's just in general in society, even if you're working down here at Walmart, yeah, that has anything to do with Tabo. I think he's talking about Tabo um, um, Moniki. Um, he is uh, a, I think, a star player on uh, Oklahoma State University, uh, which would lead me to believe that he doesn't give a crap about what he's saying <laughs> uh, if he can get a good player out of it, if it helps him directly. Uh, Gundy makes $5 million a year, incidentally. I wonder how he got that. Do you think he got that by saying to Oklahoma State or to the to the school that he was uh, coaching at before, like, I'm never going to leave here because I'm totally I'm, committed exactly. to you. I would never leave for more money or to better my situation. Give me a break. It's, it is super macabre that none of these athletes that actually, you know, put people in the stands – uh, make any any money off of this. They get educations, but that should be free they're for everybody anyway. They're all snowflakes. Anyway. Meanwhile, I'm making $5 million because they're going out there and getting concussions. Yeah, exactly. Develop and, CTE for right, free exactly. for me, please. It is so, I mean, I, I guess you're, we're not supposed to advocate criminal behavior on this show, but like that is every one of our single, policies. yes, but every single college athlete that has ever taken a bribe from a sports agent oh, yeah. or brand should be pardoned and immediately have the money that has been stripped away from them given back to them. Yes. It's a travesty that they're not paid. Yeah, it sounds a lot like indentured servitude. Mm -hmm. I mean, Just it be actually committed. Is, it's, Stop being such a snowflake, Jamie. Yeah. The Just regimentation has some, I think, some long... Uh, yeah, I think there's some very, very troubling historical uh, echoes there. Yeah. Be committed. Be committed. Maybe you should treat Gandhi with a little fucking respect. Call him from a the gay jodity report. Call him from a 408 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? I'm sorry, folks. we got a lot of people on uh, hold and have been there for a long time. Call him from a 408 area code. Hello? Who's this? Who's this? This is me. It is you. Hello? Hello. Oh, sorry. Okay. Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Ari calling from uh, the Bay Area. Ari from the Bay Area. What's on your mind, Ari? Uh, I wanted to talk about something that uh, I think one of your callers alluded to the other day. Actually, it was talking about sort of uh, the re aftermath reaction to the to the Pittsburgh um, terror attack. Yeah. And then uh, you know I, I've been noticing it, sort of these uh, you know Sam Harris type um, allies. I, I find their uh, you know reaction to it very interesting. I mean, I, it, this is sort of an obvious point, but it seems to me that there's sort of a a cottage industry that sort of transcends beyond just the uh, the Robert Spencers of the world, who are just really fanatical. But you know, one of these uh, I was following one of these Ian Hersey Ali disciples who's actually gained a certain level of prominence. And it's interesting. She had you know previously uh, an incident that happened in Toronto where this individual got um, it ran over a bunch of people. And uh, her initial response was like, you know, quoting, you know, essentially quoting Sam Harris that, you know, we're all living in Israel. We just don't know it yet and all this other stuff. And then a couple hours later, it turns out that, you know, it was it was one of those incels. So, I mean, I, do you think that a lot of this stuff is really more of a, a product of um, 
some for some individuals, some personal bad experiences uh, c- coupled with uh, conservative sort of think tank funding, or or because it, it, it seems like you know there's a whole industry behind uh, you know let's uh, all profit off of you know going on tour with uh, Douglas Murray and Dave Rubin and, and warning about warning the West about the infiltration by uh, infiltration of the West by Muslims. So you know, I don't think. I mean, listen, I think the. I don't think that all right let, let me put it this way this is the way I think it works I think that they're on on the right they the attitude is let a thousand flowers bloom now you can have that uh, attitude on the on the left as well the difference is that the right has enough money that we're going to fertilize enough of the area that more flowers bloom okay and so oh. So um, Dave Rubin, at the very least, gets a bunch of Koch, uh, Koch brothers money. They don't say we're giving you this money to go promote, um, you know, uh, Jordan Peterson and uh, Ben Shapiro. But they give him the money. Sure. And uh, then, you know, Shapiro, maybe he gets his funding from uh, some other uh, right wing billionaire or through the Heritage Foundation or something like that, and they go on each other's show, and it's profitable for both of them, and they can turn around and show their funders, look at how many hits I have on YouTube, and they get more money that way. And so that's the way it works. There's nobody there with a grand plan. And, and I imagine there are plenty of people that they end up shuttling money to that don't, don't pan out, and that's fine, um, uh, because there's just a lot more money. That money doesn't exist on the left. And so... You know, it, it's uh, the only thing I can tell you is that what? having been a student of 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 uh, early antiquity religions, you you could see like there was you know we could have ended up with something called uh, you know uh, or, you know there uh, maybe Christianity wouldn't have been the primary. It just it was by chance. We could all be uh, you know uh, Men, uh, Menichians uh, at this point. It's just. That was one that just didn't, the environment wasn't right for it to survive. But there's enough oxygen yeah. pumped into the right there that that stuff grows. And that's what I think happens there. Well, I, and I think well, some I just, people. I was just going to say, I think this. I think some people. Oh, sorry, based, I, was, I was just going to say. Go, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go, Ari, and then I'll, and then I'll finish. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I mean, the Shapiro thing. There's a. I think there's a distinction because I, I. I would actually. I wouldn't be surprised if Shapiro believes a lot of what he's. Oh, uh, the oh, housing, okay, but I, I mean, Dave, Dave Rubin is Dave Rubin is just a hoe. I mean, the guy goes to the highest bidder, whatever it well, is. You know, he used to be I think, on listen, Sam Harris's jock. Now he's you know mostly you know on the Jordan yeah, think, Peterson uh, bandwagon. Listen, so that's, there's a distinction there. But obviously, yeah, I mean, they just you know it it is it does pretty much function the way you're talking about. I would, right. I would well, assume. I appreciate the call, Ari. I, yeah. All I can tell you is that, like you know, I think there is. For a lot of these people, there is a basic, you know, set of beliefs. Some may be more closely held than others. And, you know, you'd be surprised on how um, motivating, um, you know, easy money is to enhancing those beliefs. I mean, that's why I think, you know, I, I, I think that's the story of Gavin McGinnis. I mean, I don't think, I mean, Gavin McGinnis was always sort of an obnoxious, uh, I think, inclined to have the ideology he has. But uh, I, I think he um, he also if he had if someone stepped up to him and said, like, hey, Gavin, we're going to pay you three million dollars a year to host an e-, e program. We just need you to tone down your your politics. He would have been like <laughs> politics. What politics? Uh, I, I've, but- I have heard uh, th- that speculation, I think, is rooted in, in real things. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I know. I I, I had interactions with him. I know people who know him. I know uh, of of uh, offers that have been made to him for various, uh, you know, if somebody stepped up with that money, his politics would go right away. But this and listen, you know, he's getting paid by CRTV. I don't know how much money he's getting. I know very few people watch his show, but he gets a lot. He's like what is known as a loss leader. You know, it's like an HBO show that nobody watches but gets a lot of press. That's what he does. I can tell you this, that Mark Stein, someone whose name most of you have never heard. And I mentioned him on the show, but he fills in for Rush Limbaugh occasionally. And when you fill in for Rush Limbaugh, you are chosen because you are no threat to him, <laughs> to Limbaugh. So that you know that you're, you're basically, you, you've, you've peaked. 
Mark Stein was brought on to uh, CRTV. He was uh, a writer, I think, for the National Review. A guy who lives up uh, like up in Vermont or something, and originally from Canada, I believe, or, or, or by way of Canada. He came down to New York. He did the show uh, for a couple of months. The show fell apart. He went to arbitration. Okay? He went to arbitration, which means that they didn't want to pay him what was due him in his contract. He probably had a pay uh, or play contract. I don't know for how many years it is. Let's just assume it was for five. That would be pretty long for internet world, but let's just assume it was five. They had to pay him out in arbitration. Four million dollars. Now, I'll tell you something. I know the metrics of this business. There's no way Mark Stein was going to generate $4 million, never mind over five years, over 10 years, this dude wanted to do it. The amount of money that they're pumping into the system, and no one's quite clear where the money's coming from. It's supposedly Mark Levin's uh, operation. But Mark Levin does not have $4 million to pay out Mark Stein. So there's a lot of money there. I'm not exactly sure what it is. All right. Um, but that's the right. freak who did the cat video. Yes. <gasps> Jesus Christ. Right. And that's how he got a budget for that. They should, police should, I believe in using the Patriot Act on that guy. I want to see what's going Wait, on with what? that. All right. We have one more call. Uh, call from a 215 area code. I'm sorry. I got to jump it. Uh, I yeah. got to jump relatively soon. Who's Hi, this? Hi, Sam. Mindy. Hi, Sam. It's Mindy. Mindy. Hi. Listen, I just. Hi, how are you? I'm good. What's going on? I wanted to make some clarity on my on my area because you were talking about it yesterday. Everybody was weighing in on Richborough, Bucks County, and okay, and all that. This is the Fitzpatrick um, uh, race. All, yeah, I'll give you a little bit of clarity about it. Okay, if if, if you want to hear it, do you want to hear it? I mean, yeah, sure. Okay, so anyway, um, Brian Fitzpatrick, um, the guy that one viewed himself as a moderate and that he said that he opposed Trump a lot, which I think his record was like 83%. But he snowed everybody here. Plus he got all the endorsements from, yep. like you were talking about yesterday. But he had massive signs. I'm talking like billboard sign size signs, like, I don't know, 15 feet by like 10 feet signs that he had all over that said, you know, Shmeshma endorses me, and this union endorses me, and that union endorses me. So that's, that was one thing he did. The other thing was that a lot of people I know wanted to work for Scott Wallace, and he was so cocky. He never answered anybody's phone calls. He never called anybody back. He never engaged with the people here, and he just thought he was going to win with all of his money. That was two. And the third thing is this area is – about 30 years old that it, it's been developed. It used to be all like pig farms and cows and, and a lot of like there was KKK up here originally. So when we started to move in with all the like the McMansions that we that, that we put in, yeah. you know, there was like tons. There's like tons of them. There's like tons. There's like house after house after house. We have two high schools, four middle schools, like 10 elementary schools all in the same school system. And what happened was um, we built this, and so the, the older people were Republicans, never got used to us, and we never got used to them, and we just lived, like, side by side with them. So there was always a big blue-collar and conservative population here that was originally here. And then, to boot, we started to get really Russian populated. Like, we're extremely Russian here, like, a lot. Okay. And they 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 all go they all go for Republican. So, and they're all Strong citizens the here. Well, no, I mean, so I think citizens. like you know, listen, the, uh, Mindy. The real the real weird thing is just sort of how uh, it, it's not surprising to me that Republicans would vote for a Republican. What is more surprising to me is that Democratic institutions would lend support to a Republican. It doesn't. It doesn't. Well, uh, yeah, even, yeah, but also you have to understand a lot of the people have money here, and they got a lot of money. They got a lot of the tax break back to the old, the old right. thing which I've been talking I get to that. you about for a year. Hmm? I get that. I get that. But I'm talking about not so, even uh, the voters. I'm talking about why should this guy get, 
union support where, you know, uh, I think it's a mistake. It's a short it's a short sighted mistake by uh, the unions, frankly. You know, you know, he got his brother's seat, right? Fitzpatrick. Brian Fitzpatrick got his Fitzpatrick got his brother's seat who was loved here. Right. You know, and also he makes pretend he's for uh, the health thing. He does he's do, he does this whole opium thing. He's very aggressive. He did this other thing where he would like have fake um, call in town halls all the time, but and he would only talk about opioids. So, and he's very um, blue collar. You know, he's just that. He's yeah. that every guy that every guy guy. Oh yeah, I no, can't I know stand that. him. And I know. It, Believe me, you don't so have to that, tell me that's about why that. He went, but last thing, it was Scott Wallace's seat to take. And if he was a little more proactive and he engaged him with the community and he would have reached out further, he definitely could have won. All right. Definitely. Well, so uh, that, missed opportunity. That's the whole story here. Mindy, thanks so much. It was total missed opportunity. Appreciate and my neighbor one. I told you that, right? Yeah. Appreciate the update. Total All right. I got to go. Total. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mindy. All right, folks, I'm sorry. Uh, no more time for calls. Um, let's go to some IMs. And um, oh, we should tell you, this is pretty exciting. Uh, DJ Quanan and uh, over at the, uh, uh, the Majority Report subreddit thread, oh, wow. which we have a link uh, to in our uh, podcast description today came up with the Majority Report bingo card. Uh, just a couple of them. You can play this at home. You can look for it. We'll post a link at uh, uh, on the podcast description. You can, uh, you know, uh, there's things like Sam mentions Casper mattresses, uh, Jimmy Reefer cake song, background laughter, Jamie as an anarchist socialist Marxist quote. Uh, caller says, is this me? Um <laughs> The, is this me Trump next impression. to the this is you one? Is uh, that's that's I I look strongly for that. Right. Area. Sam responds with this is you. Uh, that's a fucking good point. Is on there. That is uh, available. You can play along with the show. Harry's wa- razors crib. But there's also a second majority report bingo card. Uh, doesn't use our new logo, but still very um, uh, very exciting and. And, and uh, of course, a function of myfreebingocards.com, where everybody wants to go. Uh, this is from uh, It Limits Socialist, or I to Limits Socialist. It's hard to know. But uh, you have things like Right Wing and Mandela Impression, Zero Sum Game, Maoist Bernie, Sam Drops an F Bomb, Brendan Speaks. When has Sam dropped an F Bomb last? That's I taken have. a little while. SJW, Susan Collins Impression. Kardashian explainer for Sam. <laughs> Jimmy Dore is mentioned. <laughs> Phone system goes down. Sorry. Michael's in the bathroom. Matt makes obscure reference. A uh, tough road to hoe. An OI Obama impression. Malice Bernie impression. Jamie gets in- interrupted. <laughs> I love and hate that that's on there. <laughs> La poupée qui fait non. There's all sorts of... Um, there's all sorts of them on there. So uh, check it out. You can uh, download both and play at home. And um, maybe, you know, I don't know. Maybe we, we print one of these uh, bad boys, uh, like, you know, do a, a late night thing. And if you do, you have to give the time codes so we can check. Right. Yeah. You can't just check it off. You can't just tell us. We're not going to believe right. you. All right. Let's do some IMs and we're going to get out of here. Uh, poor Manafort. Fast food worker, sir, would you like fries with that? Poor Manafort. This is what, well, that's what we, that is what my preference is, yes. Uh, Retcon. I don't think you guys talked about this yesterday, but Politico reported a top uh, um, HRC, uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton aide said Hillary is running for higher office in 2020. No. Well, first off, that is inaccurate. Mark Penn, who was not involved in the 2016 uh, Clinton uh, campaign, claimed that uh mark penn is a um mark penn is a uh is a total loser oh but he wasn't uh oh he was going to run for a higher office maybe this is different maybe this is a different report which he's going to run for like a congressional seat or something maybe governor i'd respect that maybe governor in new york 
Oh, maybe uh, not that. that but would, not yeah, that. Run, that. Run for like a state senate seat, Hillary. I yeah. actually a state. Yeah, you know what? Represent I, Westchester I'll in the state assembly. Something. I'll tell you something. Not comptroller. Too much I, power. I tell you something. Governor of New York State. I'm down with that. Over Cuomo. Cuomo's not running again, though. I know, but I, I think I actually think that Clinton might be pretty good for Are New York. Are you serious? State. I think she would be the same. Oh, They're on. friends. I don't understand why you think she'd be. Any she better than endorsed Cuomo. him. I or think any that different. she is. I think she would be better on education. I think she would be better on health care. Yeah. Based on what? Based upon what her policy positions were in the last presidential run. Not the totality for like career and record. Well, I mean, I think she, uh, I, I, you know. If you go back and look at Hillary Care, it was far better than what we ended up getting. I'm past. aware that Hillary Care was better than Obamacare, but the but from being on the board of directors of Walmart, which okay, to her like actual record in the Senate, which was a very right wing record, bankruptcy reform. I think if she runs Wall for Street, Congress, if she if she runs for a governorship, cards. she's not going to run for anything else. And that would be it. And I think that um, I don't think she has secret liberal politics. I'm I not saying that she's secretly yeah. liberal, but I think that in the context of of healthcare and education, which are the two, uh, you know, sort of primary functions uh, in the context of of a governorship. This is all very triggering for me. I was hoping to not ever have to talk about her again. The trouble, the trouble, Jamie. Wait, Jamie. Jamie, Jamie, let me just say something before you finish your point that will help you be less triggered. The white electorate is highly irrational and identity based. Um, And that is the uh, only way sometimes to explain their bizarre theories about why Hillary Clinton might be a good progressive guy. Like, I don't even care what we're saying about her right now. I feel like the more we talk about her, the more like clout points she's getting somehow well, mystically all right well let's move on vispa i mean i you know i'm saying this in a vacuum it's quite possible there would be someone who i like better running but um i'll give you one i'd vote for hillary clinton over bill de blasio <laughs> well i mean who do you, who would you anticipate would run for governor i have no clue i mean i but i could tell you honestly i mean even joking i probably i would vote for de blasio over hillary clinton frankly so actually you could probably name me well i would vote for de blasio over clinton okay so de blasio is actually the only other big name that i've heard in contention and i'm sure she would smoke him i didn't think you would i've heard that you guys okay amazon cuomo is governor for life there's no point in having this can i get a show far for being blocked by dave rubin on twitter sure you can Says Vispa. Crystal Lick. In the case of many artists and small business people in Long Island City, Amazonia is a death knell. It's not likely the fledging arts community can be maintained for much longer. I personally have a lease for a little more than two years. We'll see how much I can count on that. So in light of that, the coming weekend's open studio events could be the last in the neighborhood we'll host. So anyone interested, come check it out while you still can. Yeah, it's a good point. Jez Garzlay, a uh, question for the full crew, uh, but Sam first. Are Linda Sassor and... Tamika Mallory, anti-Semitic. If not, how do you know? I don't know. I have, to be honest with you, I'm not familiar with. Well, Tamika Mallory was part of the uh, the women's march. She said she spends it up, time with a Farrakhan. I don't really consider either of them to be anti-Semitic. I understand why it bothers some people, but I also think people need to be a little less melodramatic. But I'll look into it a little more. It is. I think she's super tone deaf, but I don't know if she's anti-Semitic. Uh, it, it it's it's. Conceivable that she's uh, anti-Semitic. It's conceivable that she's not. I don't know enough, but I am quite um, convinced that the concerns about uh, if you can point to me uh, a case of uh, leftist violence against Jews, um, then I would um, I'd be far more concerned about it. But I can tell you that in 2017, the, the anti-Semitism acts of uh, of anti-Semitism, as reported by uh, the FBI. Um, have shot up significantly, and I don't think it's because of Louis Farrakhan. Who Although, is, who is on the right? Let's let's all let never forget that. That's a that is such American racial rhetoric. Like the only reason that he is identified on the left is purely because he's black. His politics, his economics, his religious views are right wing. The DX fool. He supported Trump. He supported Trump, and he has a long history. He supported, you know, Reaganomics, essentially. He is a man of the right. American D- politics don't make any sense. 
The DX Fool, hello, social Jewish warriors. Is the IM bucket open, unlike yesterday? Regarding Monday's interview, Fox employees were reportedly mad at Sean Hannity for lumping Fox News with the media at the Limbaugh Piro rally with Trump that partly led to Claire McCaskill's ouster. My question is, why is Fox News not considered a member of the media and are outlets like Washington Examiner, Newsmax, Breitbart part of this group? Um, also, it's Transgender Awareness Week and still no TGNC members in Congress, Jamie Peaches. Breaking Mike Espy will debate Cindy Hyde-Smith on November 20th in a one-hour broadcast debate in Jackson, Mississippi. Excellent. Lewis, 77. I'm curious to hear Dinesh D'Souza's pretzel logic regarding the Democrats and their racism in light of the recent representative elects. I guess, according to him, being a real racist means electing people of color into higher office. Most of the African-Americans who won, won in uh, predominantly white districts. I mean, overwhelmingly white districts. Uh, Turnip Bega, Sam, I've been using your Kirk and Libertarian debates in my college freshman writing class to teach students about argumentation. They thought you mopped the floor with Kirk. And a, a student who was self-professed Libertarian seems to have changed his mind. Do more debates for the kids. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, that's very, uh, I, <clears throat> I can't tell you how much I appreciate hearing that's that. That's awesome. And Bonora, Republicans keep talking about how to continuing to count the votes, putting the results into question. <laughs> Someone online said, well, these are the results. The Chris Lepako, I like veterans who don't have both eyes. If you have both eyes, that means you're not patriotic enough. Um, oh, shoot. Okay. Uh, three more. Dave in Miami. Sam Bernie recently said in an interview that it's good strategy to use the fact that Trump doesn't actually believe in anything against him. In other words, he would be willing to pass whatever bills make him look good. Do you think this is a good strategy now with the House? Yes. No zini. Dems should introduce legislation on making presidential and midterm election days holidays. It would be win, win, win. I agree. And the final I am of the day. I don't need to base my entire identity around being white because I actually have a personality, interest, intrinsic value in myself, etc. See you. Oh, uh, tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know Shifted in and out of